Hello and welcome to Stacking Dinger Show, your home for all things underdog Major League Baseball. Visit our Substack at stackingdingers.com for this show, rankings, and all of our written work. This episode tonight is the Outfielder Rundown. We'll try to cover every relevant outfielder for the underdog best ball season-long format. I am Matthew, a.k.a. Sheep, a.k.a. Dark Sheep, and you can find me on Twitter at D4RKSH33P underscore and you can follow my draft streams on Friday nights at the Sheep Seats on YouTube. Uh, regular Stacking Dinger contributor Nez is here tonight. He can be found on Twitter at, at Nez Takes. And you know him from all of his streams for all underdog sports on YouTube at the Badge Bros. As well as you can find some of his uh, maybe work later on upcoming. I know he's revamping his website is NezTakes.com. Um and uh, last week we had Easy join us for the infielder episode, so we're, we're running it back again. Uh, he's on Twitter at Easy116 and on YouTube at EasyDFS. And he also puts out DFS and best ball tools over at EasyDFS.xyz. So here we are, outfielders tonight, guys. Welcome. Thank you. That's a beautiful, beautiful intro. And yes, I am hard at work revamping nestakes.com. Uh, it was frustrating today, but uh, that that is coming. Written work for the season, specifically for Underdog Dailies, is coming at nestakes.com. You can get it fresh off the press every morning. Looking forward to that and looking forward to this episode. Thank you, Sheep. Thank you, Easy, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me back. There's... It, outfielders are there's fewer of them i think that matter um so yeah we will try to probably get through literally every single draftable name in the pool in uh just about as long as the infield show that's the goal that's the goal <laughs> I, Buckle in. Is, it's not gonna be like the pitcher one where i'm not gonna abort it halfway through and create an episode two out of it so let's let's bring up our our board from our friend Chris. Uh, so just like last time, we have the. Uh, oh, he left me a note here. So <laughs> <laughs> he Very did. Thoughtful. He did. Well, I don't think he actually did it, but he said, "What would be? If, I wonder if it'd be funny if I changed the projections on one of these guys to some and see if anybody noticed it." So uh, I don't think we have to worry about that, but we'll see. Um, yeah, so uh, his sheet, if you haven't seen it before, has the live ADP uh, as well as the player name, team, uh, and then it splits up into bat and ATC projections. Uh, here is just the basic ranking uh, for uh, all players, uh, and then the position ranking, I believe, is based off the bat positions. And then over on the right, you have a little more in-depth what that means, and this includes... Uh, projected games and plate appearances, as well as what that means in underdog scoring for what these different projection systems are saying. Uh, and then the other one that we look at uh, and sort of balance the overall projection with is the points per plate appearance. So that's what we're looking here. Uh, so uh, I'm going to actually say that we have this first group of 10 outfielders that uh, we have pretty much go in every draft between uh, pick one through pick 12. Um, almost always no one makes it to the second round. Uh, so I'm going to give everybody, you know, I don't think there's too much super exciting to dive into these like total elite guys. So I'm going to give everybody one, 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 one thing to say about this group. Sure. I think that's the best way to do it. Uh, you can kind of pick your favorites in here, which, I would recommend doing. I think it's kind of – it makes the first 10 picks more fun because, like you said, it's so predictable every time. And the first round, you just kind of, like, want to get it over with. So, you know, if we were to spend time splitting hairs over, like, these elite outfielders, it just wouldn't really make sense because you can make a case for any of them and I wouldn't really fault you. Um, but I am kind of, like, taking my favorites through this range. Uh, but can't really uh, can't really fault anybody for, for – doing this one way or the other, just letting, you know, the whoever's top of the board and, and going with that and that being their pick or, you know, having having a favorite in the group. Uh, for me, I tend to venture more toward the guys with the darker red underdog point uh, point per plate appearance uh, when it comes to who I'm 
gravitating towards personally, but yeah, all, all good picks. Yeah. You, you pretty much can't go wrong. That doesn't mean that I don't like my highest spike scores, which is something that I really care about. If like all else is equal, um, judge and Jordan one Oh ones, uh, Acuna and Soto right after that. Acuna is obviously my one Oh one. Jordan is my, is my guy I like most versus ADP in this range. I get a lot of Otani. Um, and I'm, you know, less so on Corbin Carroll and Julio Rodriguez, just like, you know, if I had to pick, but I'd say the top Acuna is his own tier. I think Soto judge its own tier. And, you know, I think you can make an argument for pretty much all the rest, um, anywhere from, you know, four through 10. So I'm like perfectly happy. Any top 10 pick, honestly, as you know, it's merits. Yep. Uh, but yeah, obviously there's, it's not too often that you have such a, a one dot zero. There's no, there's no decimal point on that Acuna. So that's, and everything just plays out that like, I mean, look at, he's, he's got the highest per plate appearance. He's got the highest total just by a ton. So, um, there's, there's no reason to think any of that was fake from last year. <clears throat> so then we get into at the Kyle, t- uh, Kyle Schwarber, sorry, the Kyle Schwarber tier, uh, or he's sort of the next one that gets pulled up into the, uh, at the one, two turn. I know easy. You have, you have thought about this a lot. And, uh, so I'll let you talk a little bit about your thoughts on Kyle Schwarber first. Yeah. So I've, I've gone back and forth on it. Um, I do think there is a somewhat significant tier break between those locked in first round guys and Kyle Schwarber. So, um, I have a hard time, you know, do you want to go to battle with, so 10 out of 12 is whatever the math is, 80%, um, 83% of the field has a better outfielder than you do. You know, it's not inconceivable that Schwarber can beat them. I just don't think he does most of the time. So you're going to battle with, you know, an outfielder worse than everyone else um, in, in your in your lobbies. Then again, you know, if you make it to the playoffs, that changes. So I prefer... Um, stylistically to go, you know, try and win at the other positions than take Schwarber. But, you know, obviously his like power is his number one tool. You can sack the Phillies. Like I get it. I do have him ranked like right at ADP. Um, so it's definitely a fine pick just stylistically when I'm the person cl- cl- clicking the button, it's not a button that I love to click. I agree. I'm pretty light on Schwarber right now, personally in my drafts. And it really has to do with what you said when it comes down to beating your lobby, like first and foremost and getting advanced and obviously you get your money back if you do that, but regardless, you still have to still have to get past that, that first round. Uh, Schwarber isn't a name that I'm gravitating to. I am looking way more towards the infielders that go in that range of which you have the, the, the pick of the cream of the crop there along with Spencer Strider, who has the ability to separate big time as well at his, in his respective position. So it, it's tough for me. And, and it also doesn't, help that you know the schwarber being like the poster boy for like three true outcomes uh you know is not something that i enjoy to to watch (laughs) so it kind of creeps into my analysis you know it's it's a fault but you know i don't really like guys like that and and it definitely is, is is something that creeps in there but uh you know the the 47 home runs are are a little hard to uh to to turn your nose at when in our game specifically home runs are are just so uber important but i think he is like without question the outfield 11 or or yeah yeah he'd be the outfield 11 yeah uh with, without question but it's still not something that i like to do very much i do know that you like to do a lot of Adelis garcia and he's next i do and he he comes more usually uh at the at the other side of the board uh on the in the second round so uh, I know you're taking him over these other guys some, so I'll let you keep going on him. Sure. Yeah. Autolise is uh, is a tough one. You know, it's I can hang my hat on correctly, quote unquote, correctly fading him in years past, because once again, projections are not super excited about Adelise Garcia. Uh, you know, I was talking to you guys before the show. There's an outfielder that we'll get to like toward the end of the show that has similar split projections to Adelise Garcia. Now the big 
you know, difference in these in this factor is that he plays on one of the best offenses in baseball. And we're not, you know, playing WRC plus leagues here. We're playing points leagues. And he has the ability to just rack up points because of the fact that this Texas offense is is so, so good. And I am such a believer in this offense uh, for the Rangers. I also think Adelise is just maybe kind of a projection breaker a little bit. I mean, I, I've seen I've, a little bit of eye test kind of creeping in here, but just seeing him play, man, uh, you know, the power is so there. Almost got to 40 home runs last year. I don't know that that's fluky <laughs> necessarily. I mean, he's a grown-ass man. Uh, you know, 100 ribbies, 100 runs last season. You'd like him to walk a little bit more, but for me, it's just a believer in the type of player he is and the offense around him. Is, is why I prefer to take him over some of those infielders when I am drafting at the other end of the board, not necessarily where Kyle Schwarber typically goes. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, this is working out pretty well because I know easy uh, Mike Trout, uh, you're, you're, in, uh, you're in on him this year. Yeah. I mean, it's a generational opportunity for literally the best baseball player of our lifetime. Um, except for Barry Bonds and, you know, pretty much everyone who played in the 90s. The best, you know, possibly clean player that we've seen play. Um, let's let's say it that way. Is he going to play 160 games? For sure not. Is he going to play 140 games? Also probably not. But um, in a single week sprint or two week sprint, I have Mike Trout as, you know, the fifth best outfielder in the format. Um, you know, his last year, if you look at his, you know, splits, like a, he missed time and B he played hurt, you know, that could be, that could just be who he is at this point. But last year was his first year since 2016, where he slugged under 600, like, um, <laughs> which is a really big number. That's you know? crazy. Um, in so, 20, yeah, in 2022, he hit 40 home runs in 119 games. So, like, his last healthy season, the year before last, 40 home runs in 119. So, like, if he does that again, it's like 630. Um, it's not a great lineup. He lost, you know, protection in Otani. I get all that. It's not a great ballpark. But if I'm just trying to bet on a guy being who you need in a playoff stretch, I think, you know, I'm going to take my chances on Trout. Okay. Yeah, and obviously the the we're at the point in his aging curve that people are starting to dock him for that. But how can you apply a general aging curve to Mike Trout? That's the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, next up, Randy Rosarena. Uh, we saw some rumors going into the season, the off season, that they were looking to maybe move him, but it seems like I haven't. This, those seem to have dried up, so it seems like he's sticking in Tampa Bay. Uh, he is projected to be that guy uh, before, uh, yeah, before Garcia and Trout. That comes after Schwarber. Um, and Nez, any Rosarena takes? I mean, Rosarena is, a, is, a, is an awesome player. You know, he's very fun. Uh, to watch in real life and he's he really improved last year like he he kind of burned me last year uh you know the slugging went down a little bit but he took five percent more walks last year and you know cut the k rate again for the for the third or the second straight season i guess you could say um along with you know having a babbit that is lower than his past two years as well so i mean really good season by by all accounts and he and uh, garcia were two players that i was you know not not super high on and you know i'm kind of taking my medicine and uh and and drafting these guys more i think it's you know just just a quick like sidebar it's really tough because it feels like i don't know how you guys feel it feels, i mean obviously every pick like you need to get right but it feels these picks feel harder to nail than like the infielders that go before them that feel so much safer. And even the infield that goes after them. Like, I feel like these outfielders at this range, like we, we kind of have to take them because of the positional scarcity, but they, a lot of these guys kind of scare me a little bit. Like, I don't know if that's just like, if that's even right to say, but when you look at the projections on some of these guys, it's like, man, are, is it, is it really worth, taking them over some of these infielders that go just because there's fewer of them. And, and, and I'm trusting the process because I know how these drafts go and you can really be, you know, 
trying to money ball your outfield if you don't take these guys. But um, a Rosarina is, is certainly safe, right? He's not going to, he's, he's not going to have a bad season. The dude's done nothing but produce since he's entered the league. Uh, but it's just like, is he going to do enough that warrants like, like where he goes in the draft where there's so many like guys that can be position one at their position. I don't think there's any way Randy Rosarina can finish his outfield one. Um, but good player won't kill your team. I'm not rushing to the podium to take him either. Yeah, yeah, I, that, I agree a little. That's that's exactly how I feel about th- this this range. Uh, yeah, because especially when you're on the like two three over in that side of the turn, um, like I have a hard time taking these guys when like I could go uh, Alonzo Endeavors or Vlad Endeavors. It's just like. Uh, I think it feels awful. I think, <laughs> it I think yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one one pre- roster construction quirk, um, I will say, and this is like talking about infield, but it blends to outfield. Like for the beginning of the of the room, like the one, two, three slots, um, you have a chance in at the four five turn. If you if you go if you start with Acuna and then you go infield infield, which I, I, I kind of like. Mm-hmm. Um Nimmo has a 48 ADP. We'll talk about all these guys later. You, like Nimmo, Hap, Castellano, like they're not great names, but like that's the window and pocket you'll be in. So a guy like you know Nimmo will talk about it. It's like that's why I kind of like uh, taking Alonzo. And similar for Vlad, like you have a chance at George Springer. So like, and one reason I don't love Adolis Garcia, I don't think he's got a super. Like I think we saw in all likelihood we saw his ceiling last year, um, but you can pair him with a Seager and Semyon um in the next round so that's kind of nice it's you know I, I leave the light on for him but randy rosarina is a guy who i don't know it, it he's accumulator ish he's like a premium accumulator if that makes mm-hmm. sense um it does yeah like i have him rated you know 24th his adp is 24 but um you know when i'm there clicking the button it's not one that i i want to click i'd rather to your point nez like he's not going to be one of the top five outfielders, a top one outfielder, but like you have two chances at taking potentially the number one infielder in the format, you know, mm-hmm. whatever your bet is on. Yeah. Oh, uh, so is, is that similar then for Luis Robert? I think so, but I think Robert has a higher ceiling than, than Randy does just because I think the power, the power there is, is very real and, you know, I'm not, not, and, and splitting hairs with the age, but, you know, being a, a more favorable age, Luis, uh, Luis Robert, uh, it, you know, in his age 26 and a half season, uh, we just saw him hit 38 home runs. Like we finally saw him play more than 98 games. And, uh, and it was kind of what we, what we thought it would be. Now it's, it's tough because, you know, he's not, he's not getting a lot of walks. But I like I said, I think the ceiling for him is is definitely there. And I'm also not super, super like like the White Sox are not gonna be good. But yeah. I'm not incredibly bearish on the players that hit around him for him to have the ability to get, you know, certainly a hundred RBIs, but maybe a hundred runs. I mean, he had 90 runs last season and the team wasn't good last season. Um so if he can stay healthy. Uh, I do like his chances of outscoring a Rosarina. So I do kind of opt for, for, for Robert uh, versus a Rosarina in a vacuum. Uh, But, you know, he definitely has a a lower floor, but I I like his ceiling outcomes a lot. Yeah. I keep going back and forth on him. I'll go for like a a couple of weeks stretch where I want him in every draft. And I'm like, Oh yeah, he's on the, the White Sox and, you know, do I really want to be stacking White Sox later? I mean, you can do it at a value though. Like you can get Andrew Vaughn. And uh, if you want to go to Andrew Benintendi and as like a, the, you said what premium accumulator, the opposite of a premium accumulator, <laughs> Andrew Benintendi, but uh, he is always there later if you're interested in that group. Um, so speaking of accumulators, Christian Yelich, um, uh, I liked him a lot better last year when he was going uh, further down in this grouping. Uh, he's been actually a pretty, I, should, I guess I should have pulled this, um, but he's been a pretty good advance rate player the last two seasons, uh, just based on uh, cost and accumulation of stats. 
Uh, I mean, for those that aren't aware, he has he has a ground brawl problem uh, that sort of disappeared for a couple of seasons uh, when his head when he had his MVP stretch, um, but uh, he's still at this and at this point he's gotten over some knee and back issues uh, that have kind of uh, held him back for a little bit, but he's just uh, going to probably lead off again for the Brewers every game that he can. I like Yelich. You know, it's uh, it, he, he's Wait, he's getting it done despite like the problems with this you? problem. Yeah, this is the first time I've ever heard you say that. So sorry. <laughs> no, no, I know, right? I'm I'm typically so anti NL Central uh, opponents, of course. You know, I stick true to my guns, but you know, yeah, Yelich. I'm I was kind of impressed with with that 23 season. Like I was really getting ready to close like close the book on him, uh, but. He pulled me back in after last season, and and I said this before, Sheep, on one of our first shows, where like I don't hate the the Brewers lineup, and I don't hate the Brewers lineup. Like I I kind of like the ability to stack Yelich if you do if you do end up taking him. Uh, I mean, sure, it's not you know comparatively is it a smash over Michael Harris and you know Nolan Jones and Reynolds. I don't think so, but you know, he's still, as far as the scarcity goes for outfield and what Yelich can do. And, you know, I guess not, not to like give label, like every guy that fits this model mode, uh, you know, a premium accumulator, but sort of fits that, that mode a little bit. I mean, the speed, I think the speed last year, I know like steals aren't everything, but, but being able to steal bases with the new rules, I think really, really helped him a lot as well. Yeah. 28 was kind of like, a shocking number, I think. For like, I was high on Yelich last year. Not helpful to anyone listening to the show. Um, I kind of want to cash out my chips. Like, I'll, I'll take him when he falls. He's the kind of guy that you're ecstatic if you started heavy infield early and you could get Yelich at the three four turn. Like that is like that is perfect profile where you know you're gonna show up with a bunch of 40, 50, 60 point weeks. Um, my the re I, I like Yelich the least out of any of these outfielders in the thirties um, for the main reason, my spike score where 1.0 is league average. He's at a 0.99. He's the only outfielder in the top 80 under 1.0, except for one guy. We'll talk about him when we get there, um, you know, the eliminator God, but um, <laughs> so like, so everyone else is, you know, fairly meaningfully spikier. Um, Maybe we overrate that, um, but I'm just kind of leaning in. Uh, you know, Ye- I will say like Yelich is a guy that you probably want to s- stack up um, mm-hmm. more than most because when the Brewers get into good game environments and, you know, especially when he bets lead off, a lot of his value is going to come from people driving him in or facing, you know, getting a lot of at bats in favorable games and pitching matchups. So I will say that like I'm fine with Yelich, um, but my lowest target of this bunch. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty high on Michael Harris this year. Uh, I'm just like, I think I've, you know, he's just so young and he just, he proved it last year. Like uh, I was low on him last year. I, I, you know, I, he was kind of over his skis and some of the underlying stuff from that, the, what he did in 2022. But last year to me, he just proved it uh, that, it was real. Um, and now this year, the the discussion is, you know, where is he going to bat in the lineup? I mean, he batted ninth for most of the year uh, when Ozzy Albies was playing. Uh, but then uh, Harris did bat up, up in the lineup when Albies was injured for a period of time. So uh, the, the question becomes now in the returning lineup and some of the slight changes where does Harris end up uh, and so like even uh, you know I think I think these projections are based on him maybe batting six this year if, yeah. if they're going off the the fan graphs uh, roster resource um, which uh, you know you dig into Michael Harris compared to Ozzy Elby's uh, and there's there's no reason that uh, I mean there's some reason but 
statistically, there's not a great reason to be batting Ozzy Albee second against righties. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like if you if we just knew, right? If you just had a crystal ball and you're like, oh yeah, Michael Harris, like when he faces righties, will bat second, or he spends thirty percent of the time this season batting second. I think we see him go significantly sooner. Um, you know, and just kind of leaning into that uncertainty, I think it'd be really advantageous. Uh, this this Braves team is ridiculous, uh, and he, he, getting getting an outfielder. Uh, of Michael Harris's ability at the, at this range, batting in the heart of this order, uh, is just is awesome. Uh, you know, potential 2020 guy. It, it just it, it's he seems like a smash. He really does. Like he's he's you know like I like I do think Yelich is like a fine player, but once you get to like the Harris range, like Harris really feels like a smash in this range. And he, he does have a lot of premium stacking partners up here at the top. I think uh, he's definitely uh, here. He gets I think he gets paired all, often with another Atlanta. But, I mean, you could say that about any Atlanta player in these first five rounds. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I wonder um, if Michael Harris shouldn't be at the 2-3 turn on Acuna teams more often than he is. Um, right. Like, I think you're going to see a lot of people praying. You know, you take Matt Olson 11th and you pray Michael Harris falls to you, or you take Austin Riley, you know, with, you know, the if you have the 1.08 and you take Austin Riley on the way back, and, you know, that's that lines up really nicely with Michael Harris. But, like, tell me you don't want to show up to the finals, you know, if a lot of the field has Riley Harris or Olson Harris and you have Acuna Harris. Like, tell me you don't want to show up to the finals with that. Um, so yeah, like I, I, it's not super likely that he, you know, outperforms like Rosarena and Robert, but um, I don't know. I think on an Acuna team, it definitely belongs. He's he turns twenty three next month. And all he's <laughs> yeah. done, and all he's done is perform. Yeah. Um, and to and to your point, like I think the plate appearance, assuming health, the plate appearance number, I wouldn't call it a floor, but it certainly has room um, for upside if he, you know, gets some favorable. Um, batting order considerations. So, yeah, I, I, I just love this profile. Yeah, I think the one thing, because, you know, I've been thinking a lot about him, the one thing is he does have a slightly higher ground ball rate than Ozzy uh, in terms of where you want to bat him. If you want to bat him behind Acuna, there might be some thoughts. Acuna's, oh, Acuna's never on first base, man. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so next we have Nolan Jones. Uh, I know he's one of your guys easy, so take it away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Course field. Uh, I wouldn't call him super young. He's like, what, what, he's almost like a post hype sleeper that ha- is now like found his way all the way up. I don't think he really had hype though. I don't know. I, my, yeah. my bar is like, I played a lot of MLB the show during COVID and Nolan Jones was <laughs> like a, an afterthought Cleveland, um, you know, corner infield prospect that you know long swing lefty like it does he have a position is he ever going to play um the answer is eventually so I don't know, he, he again like has all the tools like a bunch of power like super spiky um you know can steal bases like should steal like 15 20 bases like has a path to 60 extra base hits i think in this ballpark um should play every day right like entering his age prime 26 27 um he's another one like i think i don't want to i'm in my uniqueness phase which you, we can argue whether that's good or bad but like if no let's say like acuna judge soto are paired with randy ross arena five times more often than they are nolan jones or 10 times more often than nolan jones you're telling me you don't want that lever like Nolan Jones is competitive with those guys more than one in five or one in 10. Right. So yeah. you don't want to do it all the time, but I don't know. I think Nolan Jones is a really big buy and you know, this ran this range. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, when you get to like the Nolan Jones, Michael Harris range there, I think you should definitely be thinking about like 
reaching on them and not in and just for having a pairing that doesn't exist because like we are sort of like splitting hairs i think as far as the projection goes for the players yeah. that like go up uh, ahead of nolan jones like the whole range that we just talked about like we're not in love with it so why not just like get a different combination with you know i think i think especially especially with these guys that have the ability to just like dominate advance rates in acuna judge and, and soto i think that makes sense like strategy wise as a player man i think he's shown like the the type of guy that you want in course field who will swing a lot and you know just be able to get a shit ton of doubles in that ballpark when he is playing at course uh yeah he's 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 he should be really exciting. Certainly a wide range of outcomes, but uh, I think he's shown enough, uh, you know, that that we can be very excited about this guy. And obviously, people are, you know, he's going thirty four point seven on average. Um, but if that, I mean, hard to ask him to sustain a ninety four percent barrel rate. But I mean, if that if that regresses a little bit, he's still a really good player. Yeah, and I do think that uh, the bat here is taking some of the the Statcast stuff uh, and regressing it a little more than other systems potentially, um, just based on some of his history. But uh, the, like looking back in his uh, in his minor league numbers, like one of the complaints about him is just how much of a high Babbitt he had last year. Um, so. If, if, if you're not too familiar with that, Babbitt is basically batting average in ball on balls in play. So that sort of takes out uh, the uh, elements that are more uh, luck driven in terms of um, uh, your batting average. So uh, if you look last year, his, he has just like an insanely high number there. Uh, but if you look further back, he's always had that. And like you said, easy Colorado supports maybe obviously not that super high but colorado supports a high babbit just based on the field dimensions and stuff for sure and it's just like guys that are pretty fast and hit the ball pretty hard are always going to be like i don't know you you can regress them all you want but like there's going to be outliers and it'll be the fast guys that hit the ball hard and nolan jones is that yeah and he's not going to lose playing time even if he has slumps in no. Colorado with that no, team. He's, he's the guy. <laughs> Imagine yeah. finding a person that he could lose playing time to in it Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> like Ezekiel Tovar might not lose playing time in Colorado. That's... I mean, Colorado of the past like like three or four years ago would fo- have found somebody to replace him with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they can't stay out of their <laughs> own way. All right, so the, uh, the second uh, – Best odds for Pittsburgh MVP on the season, Nez, Brian Reynolds. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so to be like very honest, I don't have a lot of Brian Reynolds uh, so far this season. And I mean, I know he's been going where he's always gone, but there is players around him that typically were not around him or maybe they always were. And I just had my blinders on like super, super hard. Uh I like Brian Reynolds, you know, I mean, he's just supreme oatmeal, you know, he really is just the definition of oatmeal. And maybe I'm a little, you know, uh, scarred from last season where he, I mean, was fine. A 110 WRC plus, you know, slugged 460, which is what he did in 22 as well. Uh, but it, it just really, you know, what going through that as a, as a fan and watching him every day, it just really felt like he kind of underwhelmed. Uh, a, a good bit. Now, I will say, I think the offense for the Pirates will be better this season. It's kind of interesting that, you know, the the runs and RBI uh, projections are very much in line with what he did last season, which I think makes sense given that he's not necessarily a uh, elite hitter, but I would consider him a, a pretty good hitter. So I'm working on getting this Brian Reynolds up because I would hate to just walk into a dinger season with, you know, less than – 12% Brian Reynolds. So I want more, but a lot of exciting names around him. Uh, you know, I'm curious what you guys think. Cause you know, I'm, I'm here almost maybe a little overly critical on Brian Reynolds. Are you, are either of you like over the field on Brian Reynolds so far? No, but I, I kind of want to play host here. If, if, if I may for like 30 seconds, so we have two, what I would call pessimistic homers and <laughs> 
I think I have Brian Reynolds and Christian Yelich back to back at the bottom of this range. Um, so I'm not really excited for them, but I'll take them when they fall. Um, who do you guys prefer Yelich versus Reynolds? Like start with sheep. Uh, I, I take Yelich, uh, just because, uh, of the park. Um, yeah, it's, it's a much better offensive park for, for homers. Uh, and the, the, the weather factor is kind of a, as summer rolls on in Pittsburgh, there's a lot of rain and like cooler days. Um, but, uh, I think I do actually have a, I mean, I am over the field, uh, on Brian Reynolds also. Uh, like you said, I think he's, I think they're actually useful in the same sort of uh, lineup textures Yeah, uh, where, where you want uh, a, a outfielder on that, if, at that backside of the board where you went in field really heavy early. I will say if it's between those two, uh, I will take Reynolds. Uh, but I think, I think that they're pretty, they're pretty similar. Um, but I think what you can bank on with Reynolds, like as far as what I would do use as a tiebreaker is Reynolds has like a much or not much better, but a rate more regular, uh, higher slugging than, than Christian Yelich does. I mean, Yelich had a nice bounce back season last, last season, but, um, everybody has Reynolds projected for at least 40, if not 50 points slugging more, more than Yelich. So I'll, I'll take that, uh, as, as a tiebreaker there. I think Yelich has a little bit deeper stacking options. Uh, that's, than yeah, that's very fair. Uh, but I still do like like Reynolds, Cruz, Cabrian Hayes stacks too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm not in love with either, but I take both over this infield range, right? Like, you know, as much as I love guys like Ellie and Gunnar Henderson, who I think have super high upside um texturally i do think there's a pretty good like you can feel pretty good about showing up with reynolds and yelich um you know depending on your early infield investment you know to kind of balance it like i think they're you know cromulent um anchors if you if you missed out on the early ones i do think it is nice they are certain they are like a very strong outfield tier break where after that you get springer and then another b- tier break, and then like Nemo in these next three, which obviously we will get to. But as far as the yeah. context of ADP goes, it, it, it stands out big time. Yeah. Yeah. And just to continue, I don't feel like uh, pending injury, I don't think either of those guys next year were drafting much lower than this. I agree. I think Yelich. Yeah. I think Yelich has a risk in if last year like he just doesn't lift the ball anymore and he's just like slugging 390 again you know which he kind of did the two years prior to last year a little resurgence like it wouldn't surprise me um yeah because i mean the, yeah it was a back thing and that can always pop yeah. up whenever too but reynolds lost his yankee stadium outs i think um as well but you know that's a different conversation for <laughs> probably last year I'm gonna mute myself for just five seconds here <laughs> scream um so actually, I'm interested. I'm interested to hear that you think that George Springer is uh, another tier unto himself because uh, general sentiment as well as projections do not agree with you, Nez. Well, more or less, like when you're looking at ADP, it's like Reynolds and Jones, a clump of got it, a, a clump of purple and green, Springer, purple and green, and then the next the next tier. Uh, I have been taking Springer. But man, last season was pretty scary, right? You finally get him healthy, and he and the entire team around him just like really disappointed. Uh, you know, not getting any younger, close to being on the wrong side of 30. Uh, I don't have a lot of George Springer on my teams right now. Um, you know, through, through my, um, 45 dingers or 40 dingers here. Uh, I'm at, I'm at the field on, on Springer, but it doesn't feel great, man. Are you guys like expecting a bounce back here from, from Springer? Stacks only for me. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Uh, Most of my George Springer uh, are either desperate outfield picks. Right. uh, Or, um, and, and in that case, I probably should, if I'm looking at these projections and really doing it how I believe I should, 
I should be just waiting and just being uncomfortable. Uh, but if I have him with Vlad or Bo, I'm 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 fine with it. Um, I think that's what it makes the most sense for sure. Do you guys ever push him to the three four turn? Like, do you ever panic? Like, if you start Olsen Freeman, do you ever put in like, let's say, you don't even get Brian Reynolds? Like, do you ever take Spring? I've seen Springer go at the three four turn. I think that's a pretty big mistake. It's scary, but I'd rather I'd rather miss out um, than take Springer because I get Springer. I was surprised I have five percent, which is five percent more than I was expecting. I only <laughs> take him if I have Vlad, and I only take Vlad with a top three pick. So Springer falls all the way to the other side of the board for me often enough. Um, you know, his ADP is 44, but like I, I get him 46, 48, a reasonable amount of time, um, which at that point is fine for me. I, you know, three, four turn, you know, no thanks for me. Yeah. The only way I would think I'd do that is if I was doing something creative of where like I have Acuna, he's dominating advance rates. And now I'm like pushing through this like alpha Tampa Bay stack. Cause if you do, you know, Vlad at the two, three, then you can like, you know, when you take Springer at that four, four or five, add um, Bachette to that and just sure. like yeah, do yeah, do yeah. an alpha Blue Jay stack, but uh, definitely not something I'm doing with regularity. But it can be done. It can be done. Uh, all right, Brandon Nimmo is next. Uh, probably another thought of as premium accumulator in this area. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy with him over Springer. Uh, as a foundational outfielder, um, I feel like he's a real safe play. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, just with some of the health stuff from a few years ago. Um, but uh, we saw last year just how he could put up points, even even when the Mets weren't as good as we expected. Yeah. Nimmo spiked. Nimmo spiked like... He had a really good year last year, slug 466, which, you know, everyone is expecting that to regress 30, 40 points. Um, so if you only look at last year's spikiness, like Nimmo is not really oatmeal last year. Everyone kind of expects him to be. So like if he continues to overperform and he he's, you know, I, I said it like probably a lot, way too much last show. Um, like he's a, he's a real professional hitter, like really good, you know, walk rate, um, he, he takes good ABs, like batting at the top of that order with a ton of protection around him. Like he'll see he hot opportunity to hit pitches, or if he chooses not to, then great. Uh, you know, Pete will drive him in. Really like him as a stack partner for Pete. And also, I'm fine with him as like an outfield too. Um, if I went double infield early, like I, I actually quite like Nimmo. Yeah, I, I think like one of my faults is if like I'm, you know, steering away from a, best ball bro brand is that I love Brandon Nemo. I can't, I can't really help it. I just think he's so there's no one that I just know who I'm getting more than like Brandon Nemo. Um, you know, and what, and you know, the only way that really changes is if like, God forbid anything were happened to the big boppers in that lineup. That is like what makes him so beneficial as well is that he's scoring a lot of runs thanks to Lindor and uh, Alonzo slugging behind him. But I like Brandon Nimmo. I think he is, you know, like like you kind of described him cheap. I think he's safe, and I think that you know he's. I would consider him kind of good, good safety in my opinion, just because I mean he just he's so consistent, man. He's he's so consistent. Uh, not as consistent as Nick Castellanos, who did have a pretty decent season last year in terms of uh, underdog scoring. Um, obviously, he's uh, a little bit under projected in this. Nimo Castellanos Hap group. Um, I guess Santander is there with him. Um, but um, Castellanos, I, I don't really expect much different this year out of him. Um, but we have seen some some slumps. Uh, man, I don't take a lot of Castellanos. Um, Does it feel too expensive? It does feel too expensive. I feel like we are like like very much – just kind of buying the ceiling on Castellanos. I would be, I'd be kind of surprised if he, if he hit as well as he did last season. Um, you know, it, it's tough, man. Cause I mean, you look at the, you know, his season with the reds and yeah, his slugging was like, was awesome, but you know, very, you know, very likely a, 
attribute of playing a lot of his games at great American ballpark. The one thing about Cassianos that I am worried about is that like the team around him is just so damn good that even if he is like mediocre, that he can, he can really rack up the the counting stats. Uh, so that that's my biggest fear, but uh, I'm okay with, with passing on, on Cassianos personally, just based on the range that he goes in. He's my least favorite of these like low fifties um, ADPs. I think Santander has the most, spikiness just due to like power numbers mm-hmm. um ian hap is a guy that i like I, i'm a sucker for switch hitters man um always have the platoon advantage um you know and he, he's slightly younger but yeah castellanos the elder statesman of this group um it is a good ballpark though it's not great american ballpark but i would say citizens bank is probably like a tier two or three um here's ballpark you know it's fine. I, I don't have much just because I like a lot of the names around him and, you know, I'm even willing to, you know, reach a little bit um, to get a guy with a funky color uh, name, team name coming up. But yeah, I'm, I'm not getting uh, any Nick Castellanos cause I'm getting all the Ian Hap. Uh, so it, it's, it's, uh, I just, I just want Hap. Um, he, he projects better. Uh, I think I don't, I don't know. I'm interested. What are what was his uh, spike numbers last year? Or I guess you're looking forward easy on the spike. Is is so he have oatmeal or a, a spike guy? He's projected like very oatmeal, um, just because he's like a high walk rate, not super high slugging projection. But I've always been like, this is me, IK being a little bit. Um, I've like I always think that there's more power there. Um, I forget if he, like, I just wrote an interesting article about like um, guys that can benefit from elevating the ball more, you know, maybe it's wish casting Ian Hap is like 29, 30, like how much is he really going to change his swing? He's been, you know, fairly successful so far, but the, yeah, like he hit in his debut at age 22, hit 24 home runs. And, you know, his best year since was 25, you know, maybe there's something there. The projection systems don't agree. Um, yeah, so he so he's kind of like high walk oatmeal ish, but I, I I like Ian Happ personally, and I like sacking the Cubs. Yeah. So we do I'm, have. Yeah, I don't oh. have much to add there. Sorry, okay. I was just gonna say no. I'm, I don't have much to add there. I just think that I think that the Cubs lineup is uh, is slightly underrated. Uh, so the ability for him to get ribbies and runs, um, I I think is I think is definitely definitely there. Uh, yeah, I, at this point, it's like you really like beggars can't really be choosers at this range. Like, it's really hard to find a guy with like an awesome projected slash at this range. But, yeah. um, <laughs> the, the infielders at this range are still elite. It's really, it, it really makes for a, a an interesting uh, dance when drafting. Sorry, I just needed to kind of get that out there. We're getting into this range where it's like, well, I got, I got to take an outfielder at some point. Yeah. Uh, so next, Anthony Santander, uh, pretty uh important piece of a, a baltimore stack if you're building that uh just because uh he's 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 the outfielder that you feel confident about uh whether right or wrong uh about cedric Maldon, who we'll get to in a little bit but he's the guy that just has consistently uh been the power guy in that lineup yep switch hitter again and he gets the strong side like he avoids that big wall 75 percent of the time because he's going to be you know when he's facing righties he's batting lefty so yeah and he's you know hit 33 28 home runs the last two years um i like him probably the most of the low 50s range um he's he's my favorite you know obviously gunner henderson is number one but I, i like santander more than a lot of the like the other orioles coming up I uh, I'll, I'll take a step further in that I love Santander uh, at this range. Uh, the power, you know, getting the benefit of being a lefty most of the time in that park, I think, is a very big benefit. Um, and being a lefty more most of the time in some of these, um, other than Fenway, in some of these AL Central parks, I think is a pretty big benefit as well. Uh, the the slugging, like I'm a big believer in his power, and I just think this Orioles team is going to be pretty awesome. Oh. So very very excited for. The counting the counting numbers that can that can be there uh, for Santander this season. So I I take him over Hap and Castellanos. I do too. Without without thinking. 
I do too. All right, so next we get into maybe a little bit of a multiple player discussion here in Teoscar Hernandez. Um, the, what we have, uh, I mean, if you're looking at the projections, uh, this is definitely a bat uh, over ATC projection. If you're you're relying on that uh, stat cast stuff that goes into the bat, uh, they they like him. That that sh is showing up well for him. Um, so then the question becomes, what do we think he's going to, or how we think he's going to get used in, uh, or on the Dodgers? I'm really just taking Ty Oscar in stacks only, really. Same. Same. Um, you know, I think there is some serious playing time risk if, you know, if, depending on how he can hit against righties. If he does hit righties well, then, you know, it could be ripped for anybody that wasn't bullish, just, you know, call it, call it whatever it is, but just being bullish on Tay Oscar. But for me, it's, it's a stack only thing. Um, but he has the ability to kind of, you know, maybe be a Dolis Garcia where the projections are, you know, not super bullish on him, but like, Hey, you know, hello, he's playing with like a ridiculous lineup and you just, you just take the guy that can slug, uh, surrounded by by fellow all stars. Now, hot take, but I think I'll take the bottom of the Rangers order over the Dodgers bottom half of the order. But yeah. Jay Oscar has the ability to rack up some serious RBI opportunities if he can, you know, earn the extra playing time. Which I think is a is a pretty strong if. But I think we're kind of all in agreement of that being like a a, a very real if. Yeah, he's more of an RBI than run guy, just because I imagine he's hitting six or seven, and this you know six five or six guys ahead of him are great, and the two to three behind him are not. Um, so yeah, like I, I he's stack only for me. Like I think he can definitely outperform this the spot by you know full two rounds, but that is like you know the Dodgers are an all time great offense, and he drives in 110 runs batting six type of season. Um, Otherwise, I don't think you're going to regret passing on him. Like, I think a lot of other guys in this range, like the next guy right below him, has a lot more standalone upside in Jazz Chisholm. Um, playing time, question marks there too, but I'm a sucker for that profile, man. Like, power, speed, and injuries, like, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and very, very <laughs> crucial third attribute there is injuries. I can't hit, I can't hit lefties, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I need like at least two or three flaws, and then and then I'm. <laughs> uh, you, you get bad team. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Team. Yeah, yeah. Pl plus bad team. You know, I think if if Jazz gets the 140, hits the 140 mark, like let's say he gets the, you know, the the health the health fairy that that uh, Luis Robert got, I think you could see pretty comparable numbers. You know, Jazz Jazz is really awesome. Uh, you know, he just completely he just always just seems to hit out hit his size. Uh, so I think if you get some good health for Jazz, uh, you know, it, team team around him be damned. Could be a lot of fun. Uh, definitely seems, you know, you know, if you were to take a player based on where will he go next season, I think Jazz jumps off the page as somebody that could be like two, three round guy uh, uh, next season. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm quite. A, or I'm going to take those red flags and be a little bit more cautious, but. For this range of outfielders, it's hard not to take him when you just need a guy that has the upside and you don't necessarily need to build the team around him. Um, someone who I'm not taking next is uh, Lane Thomas. Uh, any, any, I know, Nez, you seem like I don't want to put this on you, but I think That's you right. might be a, a, a Lane Thomas fan. So I kind of go, I went back and forth, man. I think Lane Thomas like deserves re a little respect from, from all of us uh, a little bit more than we have been giving him. Uh, two things have like really stuck out to me about Lane Thomas that actually has me willing to take him now. So I did kind of, I did just do a stream today and I was like, wow, I can't believe Lane Thomas goes 63. Um, looked into it more. He doesn't have a, like, his ground ball rate is like 40%, which really isn't that bad compared to like, you know, a lot of like Juan Soto is a 50% ground ball rate guy. And I'm not saying that Lane Thomas is Juan Soto. I'm just comparing here. And another thing is like, I am really starting to kind of be a spray chart merchant. And Lane Thomas like really 
started to pull a lot more fly balls from 22 to 23. If you look at a spray chart, you see a, a huge shift to the left side of the field. And e somebody like Isak Paredes has had a lot of success doing that as well, where he's not crushing the ball. The exit velocities are not going to wow you. But the way that he's pulling so many balls lately, and you know, so many of them are in a good part of the field, like I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of buying in a little bit to Lane Thomas. Like it's, it's, it, it feels weird, but you know, I'm not like going to be overweight Lane Thomas. But you know, I don't think he's the egregious pick that I once thought he was. I, I would be borderline shocked if last year was not his career best um, that's fair it's probably a bad bet because like he's likely to play another five or ten years you know if health holds up like he's definitely an mlb regular but man like 28 home runs and what, like 20 steals i don't know that those feel topish to me it's a bad team like does anyone else on that team get drafted like i can't remember um, abrams <laughs> oh, yeah, this I mean, but, was also is not in my player pool. Um, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe that's a blind spot there, but no, nah, I'd just rather reach um, for guys with, you know, more exciting profiles that are, you know, Mike, like Lane Thomas likely has a fine season. Um, I just am searching for better than fine at this, you know, at this stage of the draft. Yeah, I'm more or less playing like a devil's advocate and like and believing in it as well. But like no pushback if, you know, when you see the projections on this guy, like thinking that regression is going to like hit him like a Mack truck, like it's totally fair. But I'm, uh, you know, the 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 pulled the pulled uh, fly ball revolution uh, has has really got me hook, line and sinkered. I mean, it, it, it's a great like thing to be aware of because it stands out like on the page when car, like the bad X is like the low guy in the room on slugging. And then you look at the, you overlay the spray charts. Like this guy is maximizing for his skill set of mm -hmm. being, you know, average ish power, but he knows how to swing the ball, like swing the bat um, efficiently. So yeah. So that's one where I think you guy you can IKB and use different projection systems. If you, you know, identify those handful of guys. So that's fine. It's just like it's a pretty rich range. Um, it is for, for young injured guys. So, yeah. Uh, next up, uh, not too young, but still early in figuring out his who he is going to be as an MLB player. Is Seiya Suzuki. Uh, I I'm I'm pretty in on on this like Ian Happ Seiya Suzuki combo. Uh, yeah. And, I, and I'm fine taking Suzuki on his own. Uh, I'm interested to see how he comes into camp this year. Uh, last year he came in bulked up and then immediately had some soft tissue issues and kind of had body issues throughout the season last year. So uh, I'm wondering what he's going to be this year, but I think uh, where he's going is, you know, it, it's good. Like the, the projections say it's good. And just like relative to these other guys, I think he maybe, maybe it's, he's safe, but uh and then that's boring, but I'm, I'm happy taking him here. He kind of shocks me that he goes where he goes. Um, I mean, you look at, you, you, I mean, just right, right in front of us here, the, the per plate appearance for the bad X and ATC both agree that, you know, he probably should be going a little bit higher. Uh, he does the things that, that I like and that, you know, his skills are transferable. He's got a, like a very nice WRC plus in the two seasons that he has played projects for another 120 WRC plus walks a lot. Doesn't K a lot, really good slugging. Um, yeah, it's hard to find reasons not to like Saya. Yeah, like he might get docked. Like his, all his rate stat stuff is at the high end for this range. Mm -hmm. He just, you know, might not have favorable run producing environment just based on, you know, the Cubs being the Cubs. But if you're betting on like that team over overperforming, which they can for stretches, um, yeah, I really like Suzuki a lot. Um, he's done, you know, nothing but make people happy since he came over, you know, two years ago. Uh, someone I'm out on is Marcelo Zuna, and I don't feel good about it. <laughs> it doesn't feel like a good bet, does it? I mean, but I think you can maybe hang your hat on last season. Just like 
it, that that has that, that this has to be like the peak of his career, right? Like there's yeah. there's no way that he has a better season than last season in which it was an incredible season. Um yeah, I would be surprised if he I mean he's like 558. I would be surprised if he gets to 500 this season. Um you know, I was kind of wish casting some playing time concerns with Kelnick there, but I just think that the, there's there's just like there's not enough to supplant him like the the starting lineup is factoring in Kelnick already being in there every day. So, uh, I mean, I'm fading Ozuna as well, but like, God, it feels like it could really come back in a, in a bad way. I have 20%. I'm like <laughs> all in. Um, he's older, but like even, even Cardi says he's going to slug 490. <laughs> like as, as his, as the average projection 490, um, it's a super premium, like, he his spike score is is higher than Adolis Garcia's um for you know for me just looking at slugging isolated power Wolba, a couple other stats um really fits nicely with any of those early Braves um you know so you're getting a super premium RBI guy um in a super premium spot and he's cheap it just fits really nicely. I have a lot of Freeman Ozuna, like, especially if you miss early, like he's a really good outfielder. Um, I feel good about going to battle when I miss early. And, and you, if you look at the bench that Atlanta's put together, like nobody's going to DH over him. <laughs> it's like yeah. Louis, Luis Guillaume is there. Like they still have uh Ross resource still has Forrest wall being an actual player on that team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going to kill us. <laughs> so maybe this is where we maybe i maybe i changed my mind tonight you might lose some dh time to like the catchers like maybe like that's the only yeah. thing but yeah that's a, that's like the saving grace is like travis darnode like <laughs> really he's not getting any younger though yeah, i know yeah. yeah there's not there's not much there for him you know he's not gonna play a full full season but in a single week stretch like at least mix him into your stacks i think you gotta like you gotta force the issue there yeah so we have two young guys coming up here. Uh, Nez, uh, as the Texas resident homer, uh, and high man on Evan Carter. I, I know Easy's big on Evan Carter too. So, uh, but we'll let ne- we'll let you take him here, Nez. Yeah, Evan Carter uh, is is interesting. A big a big part of this is just like really loving the the Rangers. But another part of this is like this kid coming in. Uh, to the season and like at the at the at the at baseball's biggest stage and just crushing it just absolutely like nails ice cold uh it, he's gonna be hitting in a, in a very favorable spot in the order now what what is like interesting is like he's got one he's got one of those profiles that kind of like like kind of put your brain in a pretzel where, you know, they, they expect his K rate to really regress, but I mean, he came into the league and was striking out 32% of the time. That's definitely, uh, hopefully a high water mark, but definitely higher than what you want your player to be striking out at, but also walks 16% of the time and slug 645. So just a really interesting profile. And in, in that really small sample, you know, we're talking 75 plate appearances here, uh, but by all accounts, I mean, every system thinks that he's going to be an above average hitter. And, you know, for me, above average hitter, le- uh, you know, lefty in this Rangers lineup, I'm just really excited to get him on my teams. But maybe it's time I start taking Ozuna instead. <laughs> but uh, I-, I am really into Carter and the Rangers. Yeah. I mean, he's 21 and like crushed the World Series. Like the, I, I mean, the-, the Jeremy Pena like comp. Like, I kind of hear it. I understand it. But, like, Evan Carter is just such a high walk rate. Like, his floor, and I know we're not necessarily looking for four, but, like, his floor as a prospect and as a hitter overall is just so much higher than someone like Jeremy Pena. And I think that's part part of why his K rate was so high. Like, his walk rate was so high. He's just seeing a ton of pitches, maybe a little too selective um, in his debut. And, you know, the pitches that he was making contact and swinging at, uh, he did a lot of damage on. He's not an imposing, you know. He's not a a big dude. He's pretty lanky, um, mm-hmm. you know, but he but he's still toolsy. Like can it wouldn't surprise me if he grows into like a thirty plus steal 
kind of guy, just a matter of, you know, where he bats in the order, if they are stealing bases and, you know, things like that. But I'm a sucker for guys that do it on the big stage. Um, I know me too. And I will say too, I mean, just to like a little background on, on Evan Carter, like he was like a really, really shocking pick for the Rangers. Like people, people were really, really surprised that they took him where he took him from. If memory serves me right. I'm pretty sure that they like really went out and got this kid as a high schooler. Uh, and I mean, lanky, lanky now was really lanky then. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the fact that he had, I think he really, they saw some like really good, poss- really good possible development from him. And I think we are kind of witnessing it uh, right now. Just crush the minors, like we said, came in, put on a show uh, in those limited plate appearances. So I'm excited about him. And I just think that kind of boasts the potential of Evan Carter, the fact that like the Rangers from the onset were so bullish on this kid. He was 20 last year. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. That's anyway, what I was going to say. Was- World Series. Like. That's what I was going to say about the the Pena comp there. Like, uh, he he was good in the minors. Pena really wasn't that great yeah. in the minors. Yeah. Uh, and so also the age years old when they drafted him. The age when they they came up and had that chance is just shows the the yeah. future for Carter is much brighter. Yeah. Um, Jordan Walker, um, kind of scaring me every time I look at his projections. Uh, so, I don't know. Somebody talk me into – or some, does anybody have any confidence in Jordan Walker? I mean, I keep taking him. I do like St. Louis stacks. I think as a whole, the team has – is kind of undervalued. Uh, if And even if you're not buying into the the most expensive pieces, I like other pieces later too. Um, so, I, I don't know. I keep taking him and, you know, he, thinking about – the the fanciness of Evan Carter and like kind of seeing uh, the never never really showing over the season last year like anything flashy from Jordan Walker. Easy, do you have any strong thoughts on Jordan? I do. Like when he came in, it was like Jordan Walker is. I don't know if I want to say the opposite of Evan Carter, but he they're both like the same height and Jordan Walker probably has like 40 pounds on him. <laughs> Minimal. <And> he's like <laughs> his raw, his raw, his game in raw power on a zero to 80 scale is an 80. So like when he came in, it was like the, the thought around Jordan Walker is like, eh, he's going to hit like 200. He's going to be like Kyle Schwarber. He's mm-hmm. going to hit in the low two hundreds and he's going to hit 40 home runs like as a rookie. And then he came in with like this huge long hitting streak and he's just hitting a bunch of like singles and like maybe some doubles. And it's like, Wow, is this guy like a really good hitter? Or like, why isn't he hitting the ball over, uh, like over the fence? Um, again, super young, with a pedigree of like doing it at least a little bit in the majors. Um, projections don't like him, like almost at all. But he's a kind of guy that has a lot of variability when you look through all the sources because I think people just weight prospect profiles differently, and you know, relative to what you saw from you know his half a year sample last year, so. Cardi has him slugging 420. Zips has him at 467. It's like if you get a 467 slugging guy um, at this part of the draft at 21, 22 years old, like Jordan Walker is a guy that easily, easily, easily is in the 3 4 turn next year. Yeah. If things go well. Um, and like as much as I love Evan Carter, and I do have Evan Carter ranked ahead of him. I think Jordan Walker's like the tail, the, the right tail in Jordan Walker is like a whole standard deviation more than someone like Evan Carter. Um, so it, I don't know, it's not a great ballpark, but if you're buying in, like you can get a lot of these pieces cheap, like the premium pieces cheap, like Goldie and Arnano don't love them, but like they fall a lot. Like I think it's a good team to buy in on and it's nice that they all, they're all kind of righties and you know, you can kind of play some stacking narratives there. So definitely, I'm, I'm, I, he's a guy that I, I weighted projections too highly for like my first half. And I was like, wow, Jordan Walker is a guy I'm really scared of can, can burn me uh, Mm -hmm. on him. I think the distribution of like where he can, like his range of outcomes are really wide for, for sure. Uh, For, for me, it's like, like the best thing that I can say is like, trust me, bro. And that like, I think Jordan Walker will be a very, very good hitter. You know, I was very much like in on him at a, at like a young age as a prospect. I'm like, God, I can't believe the Cardinals had this guy coming up in their system. Like he just like he he blew me away as a prospect. And then 
came up and did some things that were like a little concerning, but um, I do really think that he has like a, a vi- like, like, like what, what easy just said, his right tail, I think could really be, uh, you know, uh, a game breaker for, for us in, in fantasy. And another thing is like, he is like, like a cut and dry tear break at outfield yeah. compared to what we're about to talk about. For sure. Yeah, so from going from a guy who could slug 467 to a guy that could slug 067, Stephen Kwan. uh, It's interesting because he gets, because he is so consistent, he gets a, a label of being safe for our game. But really that doesn't, we don't necessarily need that, especially in the, the dinger in this contest where all the money's at the end. Um, so like the, the bull case is that he just has like a Luis Arias type uh, batting average this year. And like, he's on the upper end of his project. Like if he's batting, he's competing for the batting title uh, and Cleveland is better than we expect. I know as I mean, you know, we went over the Josh Naylor case on the infielder episode, but there's, there's some pieces there uh, that we like. Um, but I don't think, I don't think anybody here is too excited or even taking a lot of Stephen Kwan. I'm not. No. All right. Yeah, Moving yeah. on. Lowest, lowest spike score in the entire pool for me. Damn. Cedric Mullins. Um, I guess the, the question why he's going here. Um, we saw, it, I guess, two years ago, his kind of like peak. Um, he had, a, he sort of led that offense in in power and speed, um, uh, and he led off. I guess I mean to say he he led off that offense. So now, we even saw it start to come to fruition last year, where uh, against lefties he was not leading off, uh, and he's starting to lose playing time. So. I mean, he's got, he's, if you're looking at him here, uh, he's still in the red for the per plate appearances uh, compared to some of the the guys around this area. Uh, But there, there's some fear here. Um, So anybody have positive feelings on Cedric Mullins this year? Mm -mm. It it makes me sad because I was really high on him uh, two years ago. Really wanted Cedric Mullins to, have uh have, have like to repeat that 21 season uh really thought that he was like an awesome story uh you know and uh, i felt i fell for it and yeah i don't i don't i don't have any cedric mullins which is weird because i take a lot of orioles but cedric mullins is not in in those stacks for me yeah stack only for me like you you could sell yourself on he played her and missed time being her and you know that's not like he wasn't platoon he was hurt um it just, you know, he's only 29. It's not that bad. But no, nah, there's, there's a lot of guys like that I, I'm, I'd i rather swing for the fences for. Yeah. And he's sort of the guy that came out of nowhere a bit. Uh, and, and so it's hard to know whether that blip on the radar of the really good seasons is real or cont- you can continue it. Um, a nice, sorry to interrupt, a, a nice people forget that. Uh, Cedric Mons used to be a switch hitter. So remember, mm-hmm. like we, this is like a popular point last year. Is like, um, is Ozzy Albie's going to pull a Cedric Mullins? And then Ozzy Albie's had like a, you know, he finally justified you know, his contract and, and whatnot. And I think he was like fairly reasonable from the left side of the plate. But yeah, Mullins used to bat switch and was terrible, and now just bats left. Um, I don't know. The Orioles are, are stacked. Like it would not surprise me if they're like super competitive and they like are getting like Jordan Westbury abs, you know, at Mullen's expense if they want Jackson Holiday to be like an everyday player. Like, I don't know, everyone else around him has a lot more invested um, in in his in their future. Yeah. Um, so Jorge Soler is next. Uh, he's not showing up here, but he is now, he is officially on the Giants. Um, he has a giant dog. Uh, I feel like that's important to share. If you can go back and find some christmas photos of him and his giant dog uh, yeah. i don't know if you have that in your model at all or any of these models but i do have to point it <laughs> out uh looking at him here uh he is a per point he is the per point appearance pick 
put way too many P's in that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the 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 knock on him, right? Or I guess there's two knocks. Uh, he has had a hard time staying on the field uh, and being healthy. Uh, and then I think the I think that's that's right. I think that is a concern with him. I think the less concern is now the San Francisco Giants fit. I think people are going to overrate number one how his power is going to play in the park, uh, and like compared to the last two. I mean, he had his really nice uh, stop in Atlanta there, but his, the majority of his playing time has come in Kansas City and in Miami last year, uh, and those are just as bad parks for power, if not, uh, maybe not as worse or worse. But um, like that, I think is a non-factor for me when I'm thinking about Solaire. Um, and then the other Giants fit thing is: is he going to get platooned? And I think. As long as he's healthy, I think he, it's safe. And even I think it's come out as as of today when we're recording this or yesterday that he is going to be the, the main DH for them. The thing with uh, Solaire for me is I think a lot of his like his slugging percentage came from from home runs and he just doesn't hit a lot of extra bases outside of home runs. Um whether that's a, a base running thing, whether that's just like a he's all or nothing. Like I, I really don't know like how to, how to explain that. But uh, I, I, it's hard to dock him too much more. Like compared to where this range is, uh, you know, maybe Yoshida over Solaire for me moving forward. But man, I, 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 I can't help but like be be very bearish after this this signing personally. Uh, anything to change my mind on that? Easy. Uh, if I didn't manually intervene, I have Solaire in the Ozuna tier. Oh. Uh, like just like just if I'm being projections monkey, like this <laughs> like Cardi says he's gonna slug 490. Um, yeah, I'm in. And you know a lot of people have memories like of Barry Bonds at that ballpark, and they're like, oh, it's a bad ballpark, but Barry Bonds did well. It's like that ballpark is a lot more restricted to left-handed power than it is right-handed power. Um, you know, sheep to your point, like he's made a living playing in Miami and Kansas city, um, which are no worse than Oracle or whatever it's called these days. So I, I have way too much Jorge Soler. Um, am I scared? Like maybe, but three years, 42 is like kind of a lot for poverty adjacent franchise too. Like, I don't think they're going to like, I don't think they're going to bench him for like, they have, you know, and it's like DH too, right? Like if he's their DH, you're not calling a young guy up to just hit. Like I don't know, it, mm -hmm. it's hard. it makes more sense in my head. Like young guys like that you want to see in the field and stuff, but like I don't know, I, I don't think there's as much risk for a designated hitter losing ABs, especially because like a lot of the guys that would steal DH ABs are also kind of older, um, unexciting players, and I think Solaire is like far and away their biggest um best hitter and biggest investment i have him like ranked 65th which means i have way too much of him <laughs> yeah and uh, the lefties that would be replacing him they need in the outfield on the days that that they're gonna be facing a righty um so i think i don't know it's weird i don't know anybody that's low on riley green um but he's still going at i think a pretty reasonable price um Again, here you're betting on health. I mean, he has – I don't know that any of the health things as he's had, like, make sense as re repeat things, concerns. But Agreed. He, he hasn't stayed on the field, so maybe there's some risk there. But, um, you know, all things considered, if he had played all of last year, I think we would not be taking him at this range. The lineup isn't bad. Uh, the biggest knock I can say on Riley Green that like has seeped into my brain too much because like I love Riley Green. I took him all the time in dailies because people didn't like taking the Tigers, um, and he was really cheap last year too. Uh, yeah. This is just like a really expensive price for a guy that like, I mean, it's not like a huge problem, but he does hit a lot of ground balls, you know, and that's just like for whatever reason is like really rent free in my head. Uh, but 
I, I like Riley Green. Uh, I'm, I'm at the field right now. I'm not like, you know, r- rushing to the podium for, for Riley Green, so to speak. Uh, but, I mean, you look at his stat cast, and it's a whole lot of red. So the dude can really, you know, hit the cover off the ball. Uh, it's just uh, – it's a pretty interesting spray chart, I will say. He's young, good overall prospect. But, like, this is such a – constant, not concentrated, but, like, this range seems to always have a faller. Um, and I just take the falling guy a lot of times. Like, Riley Green is not – Maybe he should be a target more than y- Yoshida. Um, you know, and I kind of like Torkelson, like Riley Green, if you can get it. Um, and, you know, there's some Tigers that I like late that we talked about in the infield show. But, yeah, I'm not I'm not like, super excited about anyone in this range more than the others. If you exclude Solaire, like this whole range is kind of like reluctantly clicking the outfielder because there's scarcity and they're like my outfield four or five. And I'm like, eh. Like, what? I don't know. It, I'm not excited. Like, the infielders are all going to score more points than the guys I click here. Um, yep, fair enough. Um, the, you, you did mention Yoshida. Uh, I don't have too much to say about him, so take it away. I mean, <laughs> for me, I, I think Yoshida has a chance to, like, improve upon last season, uh, you know, in, in, as far as fantasy numbers go. And – the, the the team around him like I'm like I keep I'm like hot and cold on on the lineup that that that's there uh, growing more and more bullish you know just like thinking like okay like maybe these righties can really just like be you know green green monster merchants uh, but I really like Yoshida man uh, he, he doesn't walk as much as uh, you know I I had thought he did last season but you know he's he's a perfectly cromulent outfielder i think at this range uh with with a decent decent enough lineup around him that i can sell myself yeah he, he's just like too cromulent for me yeah it's, it's like fine um i don't have much on yoshida good hitter but unlikely to super overperform unlikely to underperform all right uh yeah i i think actually pretty similar for josh Lowe. uh for me like i, I don't i think he's going at, at the right spot. I just don't click him too much. Um, I'm not maybe incorrectly. I'm not super in on Tampa Bay, uh, in general. Um, but I don't know if either, either of you guys are really into Josh Lowe. I can't imagine having like a strong opinion on Josh Lowe either way. Like he's, he's fun. He's, he's, he's fun. 20 homers, 30 steel guy, but the Tampa Bay lefties, like, the last thing you want is to show up in the finals with, you know, Josh Lowe's like, I don't know, hit 300 and, you know, 25 homers, 30 steals. And he's and they're happening to face like the Yankees, like, uh, you know, Carlos Rodon or something somehow, but is it miracle? And like Harold Ramirez is batting third. And it's like, the fuck. It's not explicitly in the model. I mean, I guess, you know, he's projected for 130 some odd games. Um, that's what he's going to play because he plays for the Rays and he's a lefty. Even st- even Steamer's not overly bullish on him, and they, they love everybody. Yeah. I think he's good. He's young. Um, I prefer him over Yoshida, like, slightly, but it's not it's not a range. I, I, I like a couple of these uh, guys after him better, like, cost-adjusted. Yeah. All right. So then we have uh, one of the uh, premier prospects coming into the season, uh, Jackson Churio. Uh, the Brewers have signed him long term already. So uh, all signs are pointing to him making the opening day roster. Uh, additionally, uh, I think the recent news of Sal Freilich, like just dabbling with playing second and third and doing some prep work there is, is a good sign uh, of the team making plans for, uh, I mean, they have like four prospect center fielders of varying levels of uh, shine, uh, but they have a bunch of guys that can play defensively center field. Uh, So having them uh, start to build some flexibility into some of those pieces, I think is a, is a good sign for this year. Um, The question is, who is he going to be as a teenager <laughs> in the major leagues? 
How much do you have of him right now? Cheap. Um, I would set the over under at like two percent. Uh, fourteen percent. What? <laughs> I, I forecasted you totally wrong. He's young. Uh, if he if you uh, if he didn't have Milwaukee by his name awesome. easy, that would be that would be that's a awesome. negative fourteen. I'm trying to change my ways a little bit. Uh, I uh, we haven't got to him, but. Uh, I have nine percent Wyatt Langford also. Let's go. Uh, so Living a little. This is. Uh, I mean, this. We don't need to get too deep into my changing views on players, uh, but uh, I. I am. Um, I, I'm starting to less worry about uh, the cost of these guys because. Um, they're they're not. Good. I mean, they're. Good. This is ninety five, and, you know. The, he, he can overpay that. And if he doesn't, then, uh, you know, I'm building him in as an outfielder that he could be, I mean, I don't know exactly where he went last year, but like same team, like I was probably taking Jesse Winker here at this spot. <laughs> so like, what's the That's difference true. between be taking a guy whose body is falling apart and has an upside and to a, a young guy? Um, I don't think that he projects like super great uh, as far as like just general WRC plus and stuff. Um, and obviously the points aren't there, but uh, yeah, I am taking him. How many, how much do you have easy? Like 20%. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I think he, so for my money, like quick talking prospects, I think Jackson holiday is the most can't miss of the, of the prospects um, as an overall player. I think Wyatt Langford is the most MLB ready bat. Um, but for my money, I think Jackson Churio is my favorite prospect um, as far as upside and the like tools. Um, maybe he misses, you know, he's only going to be 19, 20 this year, but his profile, he's, he's a little smaller or right? he's not filled out all the way yet, but like carbon copy profile to like Julio Rodriguez. And, you know, I guess he was like an ADP 15 guy, but when he came, like the cost does not matter. Like if he hits, like Churio is going to be like at some point, unless things go wrong, like Churio is going to be a round two pick, whether it's next year or the year after that, or the year after that, um, I'll continue to try and be early on that one. The hit tool is likely not there yet. Um, if he hits over, you know, 260, call it a gift, but Premium power, premium speed, like should all be there, like from day one. Um, you know, so I'd take him over TJ Friedel, like all, all day. Like it's not even close. I got to get my cherry up, man, because it is a, it is a flat zero right now for me. Uh, I mean, I, I know who he is. I'm, I, you know, I know the prospect pedigree, but man, like the, for me, it's like the minor league numbers were not jumping off the page like I was, you know, really hoping they would. Yeah, uh, the stature, year, stature is great. like scaring me. What'd you say? Last year was not like outstanding when he got to Triple A. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, even the Double A numbers are like just just okay, you know, for like being who you know who he can be. Uh, so for me, it's just like. I, you know, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll see you next year. You know, this is, yeah. this is, this well, is an extremely premium price on, on, on a kid that, you know, wasn't demolishing the ball in the minors. Bad, but if I could talk you into it, like, I, I think it's like his batting average is a little noisy. Like the bad bit is not super high for someone like as fast and with as much power as he has. Mm-hmm. So there might be something going on there. I don't know. Like, this is me. Like, I have my narrative made up, and I'm looking at the numbers and trying to tell a story out of it um, yeah. in a way for me. So I don't know. Um, but, yeah, he, he's I, – I think he's going to be great. Is it this year? I hope so. <laughs> but mm-hmm. it, it very well might not be. You know, he, he probably misses more than 50, like maybe 75% of the time. But that 25%, man, I think is, like, something you really want. That's fair. I do, you know, p- part of the concern though is that the Brewers have not really churned out any any of their hitting guys have really not worked out since Ryan Braun. 
all, all the prospects have sort of fizzled out once they got there. But th- this is a completely different type of player. Yeah, this is a different yeah. category. The, this is like top three. You know, like this is like tier one prospect. Not generational, but like can be a top three prospect in any year. Yeah. I think it's funny because, I mean, we'll get to him. The way you guys talk about Cherio is like how I would probably talk about South Relic. <laughs> we, we, we're gonna have that intervention later it is uh all right but before that uh i don't think anybody needs an intervention on tj friedel uh i don't even take him in in cincinnati stacks uh i'm just i'm just out yeah. i have very little friedel if if any yeah this this is a uh <laughs> shockingly we're taking up a, quite a lot of time this is a catch me not to play host but this is a catch me up uh range where i'm not like friedel and jungle lee like I'll take them if I got completely shut out, but I really don't want to be like having to take these guys. You know, Drunko Lee, like, you know, coming over, you never know. Um, I'm not super excited about like batting average merchants. Right. It'll be interesting to see how he plays in this park. Um, I mean, because power isn't his calling card, you know, it's just like a really good bat. Um, so he could really rack up, you know, a ton of singles, which doesn't really do anything for us uh in, in our format but could be a it could be a big time accumulator i think um you know so I, I think he's fine in this range but uh when langford is just a few scroll just one baby scroll away from jung ho lee uh it's hard for me to not opt for uh wyatt langford yeah uh i take i take lee uh just because i i'm looking at him as uh as potentially Stephen Kwan just later uh, for, sure. for that with that accumulator value. Um, but yeah, uh, before we get to White Langford, we do have James Outman sitting here. Uh, we saw uh, a nice stretch out of him last year, uh, and we've seen the upside. Um, and I think for me, I think most people he's stack only, but I, I do I don't mind taking him uh, just as, as a Dodgers hitter with the potential of, of uh, you know, couple of injuries and where is he hitting? Uh, but we'll, we'll move on to Wyatt Langford. Uh, so like, like you said, easy, he seems to be the most uh, MLB ready bat, despite yeah. maybe the lowest amount of uh, the, out of like these top prospects, the lowest amount of time at the minors. Um, he's just massive. <laughs> We're seeing the spring training pictures of him just being massive. Um, so I, I don't know. Is it, there almost isn't much to talk about about him because like he's either going to smash this year or next year or the year after it's the same sort of idea as Cheerio, but um, a different profile of player. He's one where if I could encourage you and I really respect Cardi and this is like a caveat that I probably give out like multiple times. Um, If I won't watch this, no offense, whatever, (laughs) like Derek, whatever, fine. If you ignore his, like Derek Hardy has him slugging 404, every other system, 489, 475, 459. Like, I don't know, man. Like Langford, it's just playing time. Famous last words, like he is not going to miss. Like he's not going to have a bad season. I, I don't think. I don't, I don't see it at all. Um, you know, it'll be, that'll be 30 to 40% of my rosters that lose if he does. Yeah, playing time is really like, like I fully echo uh, easy sentiment there. It, playing time is really the only concern. Um, and if we get any sort of news, he's breaking camp with the team. Where do you think he? Where do you think he goes? Like, like I know that that's like pretty pretty bullish. But if he if we get word Wyatt Langford is breaking camp with the team, it, does he go after pick eighty? No. And I, and I think part of him getting named to the opening day roster also has to do with uh, um, him doing well on spring. So that that also boosts yeah, it up the, the visual oh. visual feedback that people will have. Um, so, and and I should say that is another part of the Churio and Langford. Uh, idea i think there's still enough doubt that people have about them making the team that 
I want to take them now before that slight price increase too. Um, and that's one to buy the dip. Um, if it, if like they don't mm -hmm. like it's, you're not drafting like they're your alf usually fourth or sometimes even fifth outfielder. Like if I don't have them in April, it's fine. I've invested more in three or four guys um, that are hopefully healthy or like you take a, a John Carlos stand later. And it's like, all right, you give me April and then I'll bring the kids in when you're injured in May. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of injured, uh, mm -hmm. Eloy Jimenez, um, uh, I started out high on him this year and I kind of talked myself out of it. Like the, even when, like, even when he has been healthy, he hasn't been as great as, uh, kind of what we thought when we saw him and like the early returns on him. Yeah. I don't know if he was playing hurt last season. Um, but the one thing that you can say is like the the reason he was injured last year he, that was when he was robbing the home run that that was yeah. that like that's kind of a freak thing right yeah. i mean it doesn't help that this dude has this long bill of of you know injuries to his name but that was sort of a freak thing but like you said like it, you it, it doesn't feel awesome to like oh yeah when he when he was healthy he was mediocre but he was just hurt well he's always hurt so it, it's it's tough but i mean it's really you know, this is this is a big time like range of outcomes guy where there is a there is smash potential for him, but uh, I am not drafting him as though that is going to happen very often. Yeah, a bit of a blind spot for me. Um, I, you know, the per the per AB stuff is good, but I think I'd rather take the shot on Buxton if I'm betting on like the injured guy. Um, a little more athleticism in the profile, and I can hope that I run pure there. You always like, you know, super good hitter, but it's kind of much bigger than advertised. Um, not necessarily in a great way for his body. Yeah. Um, Lars Newtbar is sitting there in the middle of them, uh, and I think he is just a guy you take here because you want an outfielder and you don't want the risk of those other guys. Yeah, very fair. And I mean, he is also probably one of the bigger post hype sleepers uh, in, in this range as well, where last year, like he got so much steam out of like kind of nowhere uh, in, in our in our drafts. Uh, it was like, yeah, Lars Newbar went from being a 20th round pick to, wow, I can't get him like before the ninth. It was really strange. Uh, he is somebody that I think can really benefit from a strong bounce back from the rest of the team. But, you know, we're talking about an aging Goldschmidt, an aging Arenado, and uh, other guys that need to kind of uh, outperform their median out range of outcomes. But who would be shocked if the Cardinals won 90 games this year? You know, so that it's very much um, someone that I think can can have a, have a really strong season, and I wouldn't be surprised. But uh I'm not. I'm not overweight. New bar either. He just walks too much. Swing yeah. bat. All right, uh, Byron Buxton. We don't need to talk about him. Uh, he's going to score a lot when he plays. Is he going to play? We don't know. Yeah. Uh, Jaron Duran. Uh, surprise! It's surprising me uh, how much how well he's projecting. Uh, I don't. I kind of was worried about his actually like his. Uh, line of position um but uh, at building boston stacks i still click them um but maybe i'm i'm even lower on him than i should be i i was i was low on Duran last year um you know and then he kind of came up and really really surprised me um but i mean 120 wrc plus last year and all the projections are like no chance yeah, all the projections like yeah right uh so the only thing that's like you know that, that's kind of scary is like what if they just like make him lead off and now he's got all these opportunities to score a bunch of runs um i'm not i'm not buying it either uh Dur duran is not someone that that i draft i mean it's i mean in the context of our drafts it is really really hard for me um to take duran over other players at this range Agreed. Chaz McCormick, uh, I think he just kind of rates out as a Houston stack piece. Uh, he's probably uh, overrated because of that in terms of ADP <clears throat> to projection. Um, but we'll skip him to Christopher Morrell because uh, I know Easy, you have a big, pretty big position on him. Yeah. Um, he, he 
like his blurb, I think gets gives him a bad rap on underdog. Mm-hmm. Like if if you guys recall, like his blurb is like to play super utility role, and like my mind immediately goes to like I don't know Scott Angry, and like what super utility means for Christopher Morel is like someone will sit every day and it won't be him, and he'll just play anywhere. Um, you know, he can play third base and outfield and first base. Um, super high power guy, 25, 26 years old. Um, you know, had some pedigree doing it last year. Like, I, I have him over Buxton, um, who I like a lot. Like, Chris Morrell, I have him ranked 104. So I just have a whole lot of Morrell. I like, love Morrell. I, I am super happy. Yeah, I can't believe that he's like in his age. I feel like he's been up and down for the Cubs forever. I can't believe he's entering his age 25 season. Um, I really don't know why they tried so hard to like keep him out of the lineup for so long. I mean, every time he was up, I feel like he was hitting a home run. Uh, it, it was pretty, pretty phenomenal. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about Morel this season. Uh, awesome price for him for us on underdog. He feels like a he feels like a smash. Like there's no question I'm taking him over the the three guys that are above him, uh, you know, on, on the screen right now, the last three guys we talked about, I mean, it's Morel over them for me every day. And the, uh, the blurb I did see recently is that he's going to work out mostly at third base and his competition yeah. there right now. Uh, Cubs seem like they might be done adding based on recent comments, uh, but the blurb specifically on Morel is third base. And then his competition is Nick Madrigal. And that's not really that much competition. If he can play the position, yeah. Um, Spoiler alert! <laughs> Don't well, think her, so. But... <laughs> I Nick Madrigal was like, "This guy's gonna hit three thirty every oh. single year and do nothing else." And like, <laughs> what happens when you're just like a singles only guy? It's like, oh, the singles don't come. But <laughs> that's a rant we don't have time for. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jared Kalanick, uh Again, I, will, I actually kind of think of him just as the same as Chaz McCormick uh, with bigger spikes. Uh, just a stack partner that's held this ADP because of the team he's on. I mean, we obviously, I mean, or maybe not for some, but like super, super high prospect pedigree for Kelnick, um, you know, and it just took him so long to finally like break out and have a good season. Putting him in, in Atlanta seems really scary. Um, I mean, with their player development, uh, you know, the ability for them to get the most out of guys, a guy like Kelnick there, like, like a much needed lefty in this lineup could, could just destroy, uh, you know, I am, he, he's someone that like, I, I want to get a lot of, but I am like a little concerned. Like I have my reservations, but man, I, I think he has the ability to, to, to smash. Stacks only for me. He's a guy, if I was less lazy and more organized and I had like a poster board or like a, a post-it note board, like I would put like, don't forget about Kellenic because he'll never show up. But he's a guy like if I if you have Braves, like he should go up a whole round um, and that will justify the spot. He also might not even platoon. Um, you know, he, he's athletic, plays good outfield. So like if you get 140 games out of Kellenic, that'll be really good. I will say he's also the, the – um, He's the poster boy for like Cardi's like, this is why, you know, prospects projections are low. Like Jared Kelenic was a can't miss and then hit 180. Mm-hmm. And he's also a spring train. Like, don't believe everything you see in spring training. Oh, guy. man. A double whammy um, there. But I don't care. First place pays a lot more money than, you know, coming <laughs> in, third in, in your in your room. So uh, we got Varsha and Verdugo next. Uh, two more, I think. Uh, I, I take Varsho more on his own, but just kind of stack partners here. Um, Verdugo's obviously not performed as we've hoped in the past, uh, and I'm mostly out on him, um, but I don't mind it. Um, I think Verdugo can, I mean, depending on where he hits in this lineup, I think will be really, really important for his, for his value. Um, but, I mean, being a lefty for the for the Yankees in, in this lineup could be really beneficial for him, but uh, you know he's kind of like off brand every other com- compiler that we talked about. Yeah, and if you're taking Alex Verdugo now, this is where you could take Andrew Benintendi later. <laughs> seriously, no, like, always, seriously. And, you, always, and, you know, and you know he's hitting lead off. There's always a cheaper version of Verdugo out there yeah. somewhere. Uh, there are actually some cheaper versions of Jack Swinski, but uh, I know he showed up big on your your spike metrics. Easy, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Um, these next two guys, like this range, I think is supremely underpriced. Uh, Swinski and Taylor Ward, um, both really good pop for like, if you did blind resumes of like triple slashes and you threw in, you know, maybe I'm overrating Swinski's like run tool a little bit, but you know, he could steal double digit bases too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so these guys are getting docked for like Swinski a little bit platoon ish and bad team terror war bad team and kind of like fluke injury and like late bloomer but like these are guys that i think are two rounds underpriced for how scarce outfield is like they could very easily outperform like a tj friedel um that goes you know three four rounds earlier so like i'm way overweight um this range compared to verdugo varsho mccormick yeah, I think if you made it this far in the episode, like, congrats. These are like, this is like, what you think, like wait, these are the guys that we, that like, are worth taking over a lot of guys that we just talked about. As somebody that has to watch Swinski play a lot, he is extremely frustrating because he watches so many pitches. He watches a ton of pitches. Uh, he's kind of like skinny Max Muncy in that regard, but um, he, he did platoon a lot last year, but they ended up letting him hit. Uh, toward the end of the season because it was like we got to see what we have in Sawinski. it wasn't pretty but i mean they're gonna let him hit again i mean they have a bunch of mid on the team but like Sawinski, like Sawinski's gonna gonna hit against lefties more often than not is is my read on on the way that the pirates roster is currently set up but uh taylor ward man i mean slash lines for him look awesome they looked awesome last year but he had a lot of freak injuries as well got hit in the face of the ball uh that'll that'll derail anybody's year uh, but, uh, Taylor Ward is, I mean, you look at a slash line and it's comparable, if not better than a dolly. So obviously the lineup is not comparable because uh, the Rangers are leaps and bounds better than the angels, but Ward feels, feels super, super comfortable to take in this range. feels like a little bit of a gift. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, my second highest down. I would feel nice. like, um, so Estuary Ruiz, we'll stick with you, Nez. Uh, I mm -hmm. think. Are you are you still on the Ruiz train from last year? Kind of. I mean, a little bit. I mean, the the thing like sure you're not getting a huge spikes out of the guy, but the the A's he he's one of their best. He was one of their better prospects. They don't really have a lot of people to play it over him. Uh and I mean, the range of outcomes for this guy in stolen bases is is just is just crazy. Uh now in a vacuum, I kind of would prefer a lot of guys below him, but I am going to just kind of make a little bit of a case for Ruiz that if he does end up hitting lead off again for the A's and he does that like 70% of the time this season, I mean, he's going to, he's going to pay off ADP uh, because if he is hitting lead off, he can threat for like 70 stolen bases. I mean, the dude is blazing fast, but you know, that's not like what you want to hear necessarily for, for a player's bull case. Yeah, if he plays, he'll be good, but he has to be good to play. <laughs> <laughs> the old catch-22 there. Um, Tyler O'Neill is next. Uh, getting out of uh, St. Louis should actually just be good for his confidence since they don't seem to ever – never seem to like him there. Um, uh, another guy that is red in the points per plate appearance but has not stayed on the field. Um has some speed also, as well as power and um, could could smash this price. For sure. Easy. Got any uh, thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, we just laid out like post type sleeper, power speed, um, shaky path to like playing every single day. Like sign me up. Like this is the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't he be like last year's Justin Turner? You know, I mean, Justin Turner almost put up 1300 points last year, which is like really good for an outfield position player. Uh, you know, I may, maybe that's, maybe that's not like a good comp, but I kind of see them as similar skill, skill sets as, as hitters, as far as like what they can do with, with the, with the ball. Uh, so yeah. It's been hard speed. Industry. Yeah. Yeah. Getting more and more into O'Neill this season. But he was so good in 2021. It's crazy. So good. 34 homers, 560 slugging, 15 steals. He's still only 29. Big boy. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, Lourdes Gurriel. Uh, he's just more of a comfort click than anything for me. Uh, I don't want to be over on him. Uh, probably being at the field, it might be over on him. 
but he does go well if you're building uh if you get the christian watcher christian walker catel Marte combo early um, stack only for me personally i used to love this guy when he was a blue jay and then i missed out on tay oscar because i was over on this guy instead so yeah kind of like a true. fool me once never again <laughs> yep but he's good i mean he's there at, at this spot for sure next up jd martinez uh who uh despite not playing uh the full season did end up putting up a, a bunch of points for the dodgers uh uh, I'm happy just taking him. Uh, I like. I think he's got more juice than the much younger Chris Bryant coming up next. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm just taking him, and uh, I'm not like trying to project him to any certain team yet. Uh, I'm just fine with him here on his own. He's so good. Um, <laughs> in like any team that he goes to, like is probably a worse team than the Dodgers. Because, like, <laughs> every team is worse than the Dodgers, but. Maybe he has a path to playing more often than he would have um, last year and certainly this year for, you know, the Otani Dodgers. Um, I think it's just like a cal- – he's just like a caliber of hitter that's so much better than everyone around him. Um, another, like, micro thing, like, he's a guy that falls, like, you know, his 157 ADP, there's a lot of, like, 170s in the, in his average. Like, in, in, like, things like perfect games where people – like, the sharper the field is, they're like – Ooh, like, are we baking in the unsigned risk enough? And like, who do I stack him with? Like, so, like I don't care. Like, <laughs> like, a lot of raw points. Like, if he plays, and if he doesn't, like, it's fine. I have six other outfielders, five other outfielders. Um, much prefer him to Chris Bryan and you know Justin Turner. Yeah. So those are the two next guys. Uh, Chris Bryant in Colorado still has that Colorado potential, but. Uh, even when he's played uh, there, like the few games that he has, it hasn't looked good. So again, if you can, if you want to tell yourself that he did, didn't look good because he was injured, that's fine. But uh, I'm out. I know. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Justin Turner, I'm more in on, uh, but it's not as comfortable, like you said, as JD Martinez. Um, At least he has a job, but I don't think it's a great <laughs> job. Um, in that ballpark but he's also like he's sneaky he's not a hall of famer but like i don't know his, his peak was actually much much better but i'd rather just like appreciate that on a fan graphs or like baseball <laughs> reference than i do on my fantasy teams and you know when he's 39 years old yeah uh stan uh some pictures came out today he's he's looking he's looking lean. actually a little lean yeah so uh easy are you getting to stan uh he's a guy like there's a lot of variability in his adp like i'll take him when he falls or like in a certain outfield where like if i went he fits nice i think when you went oatmeal early like a brian reynolds or yelich early like you missed out and it's like i gotta make up for the lack of a, a strong early outfielder like Stanton fits well on that team or in stacks. So like, those are the only two scenarios. Like one where I'm like, just like pure upside hunting or two stacks, but like, I don't want him like just regularly. Like it's very specific for me. Yeah. Nez, uh, Kerry, Barry Carpenter. Uh, I know <laughs> you, you've, you've been leading the charge from last season on dailies uh, into this year. So I know you're high on him. Yeah, yeah, he's still like a nice a nice click in my opinion. I mean, he didn't eclipse a thousand points last season, but uh, I, I think this Detroit lineup is a little underrated. And for the range that he goes in, I mean, he and like Melendez are for me big time tier breaks at the position. Starting to think Marte is going underdrafted, but that's 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 very much like riskier. It's a very risky pick, obviously down there, but. Carpenter Melendez, in my opinion, are very strong tier breaks. Um, and I take Carpenter over Stanton and Turner and Bryant um, yeah. almost almost every time. Uh, I, I'm just obsessed with this dude. I mean, I've never seen someone – every time I look at an MLB home run tweet and it's Kerry Carpenter, it's like a high fastball. I've never seen somebody eat high fastballs like Kerry Carpenter does. And in the current meta of starting pitching, I mean, that plays pretty damn well because everybody's trying to get you with the high fastball and, you know, Kerry don't play that shit. 
Um, you mentioned MJ Melendez, who may, maybe it's just a, a price compared to last year uh, and even earlier in the season. I'm having a tough time getting to any MJ Melendez, and it seems wrong based on projections. But he was just bad last year. Like, I'm, I'm just well. worried he stinks. Yeah, I, I don't blame you, but I, I'm ignoring the FUD. And a Vinny P. Melendez, you know, backdoor is awfully tasty for a sucker like me. I'm obsessed with his, like, prior season. And I'm just like, man, if he can just get those get those good rates back, like, we're, we're cooking. Uh, it is interesting that, like, he got more expensive, right? <laughs> like, that doesn't really make sense. Yeah, he, he had did a better that season the year prior. People don't he kind of stinks, man. He kind of stinks, but you know, he's young, lefty. Maybe, maybe it'll happen. They got no one yeah. else, so there's yeah. that. <laughs> he's also terrible in the outfield, so it's not like he has a a, a glove to. Uh, is is this like a, a peek into the future of Henry Davis? I know prospect <laughs> profile, but catcher turned garbage outfielder, <laughs> waiting for them to hit. Like he was in the majors early because he's a catcher, and now he's not a catcher anymore. Anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> uh joy manessis uh nez is he coming into your washington stacks uh no which is like kind of weird because like i was in on him or not in on him but like i was taking him like at the field last year and now he got cheaper and i'm you know kind of like not really not really there uh don't really have much to say on joy manessis other than like i'm not taking him this year all right uh brent rooker we saw the post 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 hype breakout uh in oakland uh he was originally part of the twins organization pretty pretty big hype on him uh and then we saw some good stuff that uh, kind of petered out at the end uh so i don't know i'm i'm mostly staying away from oakland in general um but i get why somebody would want to take brent rooker this is like the last batch like Rooker has upside and like outfield six, like sure you can sell me on it. Like he had 30 home runs. He is either going to follow it up and be, you know, a couple rounds more expensive or he's going to go undrafted next year. Cause he's like out of the league, you know, he's like a one trick pony um, type. So it's fine. Um, Austin Hayes is next. Uh, Baltimore. Um, I don't know. I, I'd much rather, take some of Baltimore infield late than Austin Hayes. No Austin Hayes for me. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but you did say you're getting into Starling Marte. Uh, I am. I personally was out on him last year, uh, but uh, he fall like the, again here. He's 189, but sometimes you can get him a few rounds later. Like if yeah. you have the right room. Um <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I can't. I can't say that it's a good click. I, I I can't blame you, man. Like like an aging player that relied on athleticism that just had surgery on both groins. Like I'm not selling you here, right? But like, if if you know modern medicine, if mm. this surgery was fine, and he and he's playing, like if here's 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 what I, I mean. That was last. Of. That was last off season. What's that? When he had those surgeries. I thought it was like mid season. Right? Oh, okay. That was last season. Yeah. I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if he plays like if he's healthy for the major for like 130 games on, on this Mets team, I mean, for, for this price, man, I, I think it's totally palatable. It, it's a stack bet, it's a stack bet for me. Um, total compiler would play real nice on uh, like making your Pete team, you know, shine a little more. All right, uh. And then Brian De La Cruz, uh, I think uh, a Jake Berger, Jazz Chisholm stack partner too. If yeah. that for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Max Kepler here uh, kind of finally had a great season last year. Um, I don't know. He's he's perfectly fine, perfectly cromulent. I guess is I should say <laughs> the buzzword. Up, the yeah. buzzword. Um, but. Uh, is it a stack thing easy on him? Um, no, I mean, I think he has like some standalone, like he he's nice in a stack, but like, I think the gap between him and Walner is like too 
narrow, which might be sacrilege in like this part of this corner of the internet. But like Max Kepler is going to hit fourth, you know, five days a week, fourth ish. Um, so it plays really nice in stacks and he should have his job. Um, so I, I like Kepler, except in dailies when, you know, I feel like he grounds, you know, it's a double play with the bases loaded all the time, but that's just <laughs> PSD. He kind of blew me away last season. I wasn't expecting him to play as much as he did or have the season that he did have. So uh, the fact that he goes this late is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, but, you know, he goes right in front of my, uh, mm-hmm. you know, my, my son, Sal Freelich. Yeah. So it's hard. It's convinced me that Sal Freelich is going to have any amount of home runs this year, Nez. Well, I can't convince you that he's going to have a lot of home <laughs> runs. But, I mean, out of college, man, the, the bat was like – really really impressive his bat to ball skills were really really impressive jumped off the page um now with with milwaukee i just have no concern that this dude is going to miss playing time and i think he's actually going to hit in a pretty favorable spot in the order now that could be you know big time wish casting but i i don't see how south free like doesn't play like 140 games this season and you know with the bat to ball skills that i think he possesses uh, I, I think you can do a lot worse than him in at, at this range. Uh, you know, it, for me, it's just like I, I, I'm probably I probably have like prospect blinders on where I'm like, I think this guy's going to be good, and and I don't think he's going to be going here next season. I want to be early on on a guy with this with this hit tool that yeah, it's not the ceiling that you're looking for, but I mean, at pick twenty and and these in these rounds, man. Um, I I have trouble doing much worse than than Freelick. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it certainly feels like a better click than Leude Tavares, who's coming up next. Uh, I probably took too much of him early on. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, uh, but most mostly as a stack partner to an early Texas player. Um, so. Yeah. There's fragile fragile playing time there, but if he does play, I mean, he's he's probably a good pick. I mean, not 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 too bad when you technically hit in front of Simeon, Seeger, Adolis, but it, it's a matter of playing time, and it seems fragile. Yeah, for for the sake of my White Langford bag, like I think White Langford's path to playing time is getting Tavares out of the lineup. Um, you know, he's a good fielder, switch hitter, like, but. Hopefully he um, is like the defensive replacement pinch runner guy because my bags would be down bad if, if not. Yeah. Um, Andrew Benintendi, we mentioned him early, uh, probably going to lead off Chicago. Not exciting, not spiky, no power since he's gone to Chicago. And like, I don't know, I'm just not getting to it. Uh, I, I'm starting to get there more just because it's like, hey, I can get a left-handed lead off every day uh, at this range where it's, if I really just need, you know, floor and, and like, I'm really desperate to like get points at outfield to get me into the playoffs, hopefully um, then, then I'll do Benintendi. But I mean, come on. I mean, I don't need to like talk too much about Andrew Benintendi. I just think that he has the plate appearances on his side. Yeah. Uh, Parker Meadows is interesting. He, has not really seen much major league action, and I don't really get the hype behind it. I'm not sure what he's doing up here. <laughs> he's young and like will play because he's a like a very good fielder and is fast and I don't know. He I, there's there's nothing like great about his profile, like pretty vanilla, um, but he could lead off again. So he's just like Benintendi, but younger, but like probably worse. So like, I, you know, stack only. Um, This is just like the, maybe he's young. So like, you never know, but like, this is the range where I'm like trying to talk myself into undrafted guys versus like, do I really want Parker Meadows is, you know, going one for four with a single six days a week, or am I going to, you know, try and hit a home run uh, from an undrafted guy? I think some people are uh, putting some of the power that we saw on the peak Austin Meadows onto Parker yeah, Meadows just because mistake. of the name and brother mistake. correlation. Um, Jack Peterson, uh, man, I don't know. I don't 
click him, but he's now he's on a decent offense. Uh, he should be the the DH against righties. Um, is is are the spikes enough? Easy? Probably. Like I think he plays really well with Corbin Carroll, like lefty um, side of the sack. Everyone else that you want to draft is a righty there, like or Kettle Marte is a switch hitter. Um, so that's like something interesting. It, like I think he pairs really well with with Corbin Carroll, maybe slightly less so with a Christian Walker. Um, so, yeah, I I I don't know. I have him ranked like ahead of ADP, but it's just not like I, I like to be done with outfield here or take someone, um, you know, lower. I had a lot of jock last year, and you know. It was it was it was kind of whatever. Projections are going to love him on a per plate appearance basis, but uh, it's just a matter of like the plate appearance concerns, you know, because he's he's a he's a platoon guy, or at least has been for his whole career. Arizona probably going to do the same, but yeah. if they yeah. don't, Arizona has a history of it too. And mm-hmm. they brought in Grichek, so that's yeah. sort of like yeah, that's a good that's a good yeah good pairing there. Um. So yeah, you mentioned him earlier. Matt Walner uh, has quite a bit of hype in the uh, the Discord streets. Um, I don't know; it it seems fine, but I don't know that he should be taken every draft. Uh, I mean, I don't know. If you want the bull case, uh, then I guess this is my turn to speak. <laughs> yeah, uh, dude, I I don't know how a team like the Twins can like ignore his power as like a left handed hitter. So for me. Uh, you know, kind of a late breakout. I mean, he's in his age 26 season, um, you know, just turned 26, but the power is so real and has been there, you know, in a lot of, in, in a lot of the levels that you see Matt Warner in, in his history. Uh, so maybe this is like Jock Peterson on the twins, which like, yeah, that, that doesn't sound fun, but I think that he has uh, the, the power for me at this range just feels like a hidden gem, so to speak. Uh, maybe needs a lot of things to break his way to get the playing time to like really matter. But uh, I'm pretty enamored with like the the power that he possesses. Yeah, he's super fun. I just have like so much Rocco Baldelli PTSD. It's like not only like the platoon, like there's there's two types of platoons. Like there's strict platoons where it's like righty versus lefty, like who's p- starting pitching. And then there's Rocco Baldelli, who has six players on the bench, and four of them are going to be on the field before the end of the game. And Matt Wallner will be one of the guys who probably leaves the game. So, like, not only is he missing the games against the lefties, he's missing games because he's getting, you know, pinch hit for and pitch ran for. So now you're getting, instead of four ABs versus a righty, like, you know, you're squeezing, like, he gets pinch hit for a third of the time or 20% of the time or something. But the upside is there. Like if he, like he could hit his way into like forcing his way onto the like being the guy because he's young and and whatever. I also have way too much like Carl Santana PTSD. I don't know. Like they just keep the Twins could like just keep adding like sneakily annoying guys, and it just becomes so crowded. Like there's Brooks Lee, and like mm-hmm. it doesn't directly impact it, but like there's a trickle down. Like as you keep pushing guys like from second to first base, from first base to DH. You know, now Walner is like, he's not that great of an outfielder. He has a big arm because, of course, he does. But I don't know. yeah, I mean, I like the next guy. I guess the thing is Matt Walner versus Alex Kirilov. Like, why why are we taking so much Matt Walner and no Kirilov? Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I think the probably scarier pick, but more fun pick, may, I don't know. Nelson Velasquez, uh, you talked about him. Uh, just has massive power upside. Yeah, I, I prefer him um, over Walner. He's a righty, so like if he doesn't suck, like he could play every day. But if he sucks, it could be really bad. Um, and it's you know very possible, but you know small sample slug five eighty six last year. Um, you know projected to slug four seventy in a lot in some systems. Um, that's all I have at this point in the draft. Like I'm usually done in outfield here, but if I'm not like I I reach for Nelson Velasquez. Yeah. And I have, I have a ton of Bobby Witt, so it's pretty easy to just throw Mm -hmm. him on as a a six outfielder. Um, But really both of those guys, like you said, I wish they weren't taken 
Walner and Velasquez. I wish they weren't taken every draft. I'd feel better about that. Like, cause like you said, there's just sort of pretty soon we're going to hit the drop off. I mean, it might even be here where yeah, the, the rest good. of the outfielders aren't taken every draft. And like, if I'm, if I'm betting on these, these risky playing time guys with high power um, uh, and I'm getting a little bit of a lever uh, on a guy who doesn't, isn't as shiny, uh, you know, sometime more more of the times I want to go with less shiny uh, with that risk. Um, Brenton Doyle, I I don't understand why anybody would take Brenton Doyle. <laughs> the glove's going to keep him on the field, man. So, I mean, he's going to be um, going to play every day. He's not going anywhere. But, like, do you want, like, a 50 WRC plus on your, like, on your teams? I mean, he plays in core, so that, like – that can get him that that can do something for him. But I mean, the glove is just like the gloves is, is absurd. So there's that. Yeah. Power so, I mean, yeah. He's got speed too. So uh, being a little bit sarcastic, but also not um, Henry Davis. Uh, I think we've gone back and forth and I feel like I've gotten a different answer. Nez, uh, what's good or what isn't bad about the off season for Henry Davis in Pittsburgh, uh-huh. but where, where are we currently standing on Henry Davis? I mean, the the concerns are real, right? Like he's not a good catcher and he's not a good outfielder. So where do you get this guy ABs? And you get him, you know, and, and you have Andrew McCutcheon at DH. So where is he going to get his ABs from? They're probably going to have to like force his ass to play outfield a lot. And he's, you know, it's it's scary, man, because they've got you know Joshua Palacios who had a, a an okay season. You know, just so many clutch moments for Palacios, but he bats lefty. Uh, Sawinski is in the outfield, and so is uh, Brian Reynolds. So, like, where where can Henry Davis possibly play? They're probably going to force him to play catcher, and I, I think that he has the ability to improve in the outfield just because he has an athletic profile and a cannon of an arm. So, like, where, while he can't get to every ball, I mean, he's going to limit some extra bases because of the arm. Now, for now, obviously, like, what we care about is the the offensive output. I just don't really quite understand like why anybody would think Henry Davis is going to be a bad hitter. I mean, in college, the dude smashed, just destroyed college pitching and every step of the way in the minors, like forced the issue. Like they had to bring him up because he was crushing minor league pitching, just destroying it. It was, it was, there was no reason to keep him down. Now, like, can you force the issue with the bat where it's like, you have to keep me out on the field. Like you can't play Josh Palacios over me. You have to like play me a catcher, even though I'm a bad catcher. That is like the big question. But like, I know I'm, I know I'm a homer and I know I'm biased, but like, I am really surprised that people like don't want the one one with a ton of power, like for free as in a position where we are searching for anybody. Um, I just am really surprised that like, people are as out as they are on, on Henry Davis personally. And maybe that's like selectiveness. Cause like I hear so like anytime there is negativity, like I'm on it. Um, <laughs> dude, I, Hen- Henry Davis is such a good hitter. I don't know. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you where the playing, well, I guess maybe this is sort of a question, but uh, what do you think is more important for the pirates right now, getting in playing time or developing a defensive position? Because, I mean, the one of the th- well, the one thing you said in that whole uh, rant was Andrew McCutcheon being the main DH, and how much does his body hold up to a season of baseball? That's a good point. I mean, yeah. he just had a partially torn Achilles. I think it wasn't fully torn, partially torn. Um, so that's a that's a really good point too. I think that that is like a big time domino that that could fall. Um, if anything does happen to to McCutcheon um, mm-hmm. and Palacios, Palacios could end up like being very bad. Um, but I tell you what, man, he's so good for the clubhouse. They love him. <laughs> and God, dude, nobody like if there was a clutch metric, like Palacios would lead that thing. I mean, on a rate basis, Pala- like er, he had so many game winning home runs. It was actually absurd for for a, a little bit. And he bats lefty. Um, so like that's to his advantage as well in this platoon thing, but um, Davis can force the issue. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know that it's his glove that's gonna. If he's know. up, he's got to play, right? Like the the most recent FUD has been around. I don't know. He's positionless. Like, do they want to develop him at catcher in AAA instead of having him part time 
in the majors, but yeah, he, he's like super mature approach and has power. Like what else do you want in this kind of format? Um, it's just a matter of if he gets a B's, but like at this stage in the draft, he's your sixth or seventh outfielder drafted. Like I don't need him getting at bats in April and he like, he sure as hell is playing in May and June. So I think he's like a clear tier two or three above all of the undrafted guys. And like, I, you know, or the, the next tier, like, I think he firmly belongs being drafted every every draft. Interesting to note too that uh, the they the roster resource doesn't have Jason Delay, who is like the backup catcher uh, in the you know in, in the in the twenty six man roster. So they're kind of banking on him play, like offsetting uh, Grandal at catcher. Dude, Grandal was so bad. Like, oh yeah, like, man, so bad. <laughs> oh yeah, last year not as bad, but like the year before. Like, are you telling me like? I don't know. With all due respect, like the Pirates are going to be bad. Like, do they really care about getting McCutcheon like his this? By the way, this is like his like seventh freaking victory lap of like, <laughs> oh, my God, Andrew McCutcheon is going to retire. Like you really need him, McCutcheon batting fourth, taking a B's or, away from the your 101 like that you're trying to find playing time for. I don't know. Yes, Monty Grandal. Like, he, even, he even got a victory lap in Milwaukee as a brewer. He got a victory so. lap for the freaking Yankees. Like, <laughs> like they needed to so last year. Was like, they got to get him two thousand hits. Like this year, he's you know he's on base. He's good for the clubhouse. I I I don't know, man. I don't know. I I the the Pirates are are so annoying. They're so <laughs> annoying. This is Ben Charrington's fifth year as GM, and they're still rebuilding. All right. Well. One fandom to the other. Uh, the question for Jason Dominguez, easy. Is he going to get enough playing time this year to matter to our format? It's the money is so back weighted, but like I, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask. Like I have zero faith in an in injured Yankee playing. <laughs> okay. The training staff has no history of ever getting guys back on the field ever, 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 ever. Jason Dominguez, like, I love him, like, March and yada, yada. I, I did not think it was, like, you ever see those ETAs on, like, fan graphs? Like, his ETA was, like, freaking 2026 or 25, <laughs> and he came up last year and smashed for a week, and it's like, what the heck? Um, so, like, I, I think there's just too many negatives. He doesn't belong to be drafted. Okay. Uh, Tommy Pham, uh, man, uh, I don't know Is where it- he's getting playing time. Where he's gonna go? Uh, we saw him uh, when he made his last free agent decision to go to the Mets because he wanted to win and he was comfortable taking uh, a low playing time opportunity there to be on a winning team, which did not worked out. Turns out it did work out because he ended up on Arizona and being a pretty key contributor to their playoff run. Um, so you're taking him to be on a team where he makes uh, a short burst. Uh, I think, I don't think you're getting him for playing time either. Kind of a weird thing to to say, but like, I don't know if it's on like good authority or whatever, but like, he's not a good clubhouse guy either. So it's like, what do teams do with a guy like that? I mean, I know he punched Jock Peterson. That was very, very funny, but they weren't on the same team, but I, he's not yeah. he's like, he's not a very good clubhouse guy. So like, you're okay as a, as a, as a bat you would you you kind of ruin camaraderie in in the clubhouse like where where does a guy like fam go um i i'm i'm looking in like maybe um no not even like like you can't even put him in like cleveland you know like like where where could he possibly yeah, land good. but he's I, gonna I, rise wherever he goes like does he just go to colorado and just like i, just take, I think you just buy the rise like does it doesn't really matter if you take him round 20 or like if he lands a nut spot like round 18, like whatever, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, I think I actually I think San Diego going back to San Diego makes a lot of sense. You're right. Unless they're gonna actually trade for an outfielder. Yeah, I think fan makes more sense for them. But I don't know if he wants to go back there because he wanted to win, you know. Mm-hmm. No. But uh, Charlie Blackman, don't take Charlie Blackman this year. <laughs> <laughs> I did it once, I regret it. <laughs> There's like I I so want to be done at outfield by now. Like there's three or four guys left that I even am willing to click. I don't know. Do you guys have names that you like down here? 
I think the nice thing about this episode, I know we like, you know, the last episode was two hours, but this one is like, I think we're done. The only player that I think you can maybe, maybe, maybe like make a case for is um, like Kerstad. If you think Kerstad has the ability to break through with the Orioles, not me personally. Um, and then like, if you want to say Brandon, like if you want to say Brandon Marsh goes off in the playoff rounds or in the finals, like you could probably do Brandon Marsh. I mean, 125 WRC plus last year, nobody thinks that's going to sustain, but I mean, they, I mean, the reason that, I mean, the Phillies gave up a lot for Brandon Marsh. And I'm not saying that that was a good move, but they gave up a lot for Brandon Marsh. Moni- I think Moniak and Ohapi in that trade. Um, yeah. And yeah, he hits at the bottom of the order, but I'm just saying, man, he's a, he's going to be a unique piece and he plays every day. Sure, it's at the bottom of the order, but I think Brandon Marsh low-key is like the only player that I would take here below Henry Davis. All right. Well, I got lots of names here, so you guys aren't oh, going yet. I'll take some notes. <laughs> um, and I don't know if they're good. They're just not drafted. Uh, sure. And uh, it's really uh, – it's usually on teams that I'm taking a seventh outfielder, which is not a lot of teams, or it's a, a stack partner. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Will, Will Benson uh, – just like I know, there's a lot of crowdedness there, but uh, he has not in the outfield, and yeah, and not as much. So he's interesting. Uh, Pete Crow Armstrong uh, doesn't project super well, uh, but obviously, I've mentioned my Cub stacks multiple times. Just taking him as part of that is fine. Um, I'm still taking some Marcana with some Detroit stuff, uh, not exciting at all. Uh, I will still take Mitch Hanniger every once in a while, just on the maybe he's healthy and okay. Um, the but the the I think the two interesting names uh, just based on news uh, as well as projections um, matching up a little bit with the the recent news is Mike Mike Mike, Mike Yastrzemski and Michael Conforto. Um, so the kind of the the news is that. I don't know how you want to interpret the news from today, but basically they got said said to be the main outfielders, the starting outfielders, like the, no mention of the platoon. Uh, um, we have Bob Melvin there now in San Francisco. So like there's definitely some question uh, about what that team is going to do, like how much of it is front office driven and how much of it was Gabe Kapler driven. Um, but uh, also, those guys also just might kind of suck. <laughs> I, I mean, Austin Slater is going to play against lefties, but who's he going to? Who, who's who's leaving that that lineup if he does? Um, does it matter? You know, like I mean, do you want either of these guys either way? But I mean, Slater's going to play against lefties. But yeah, I think stack only for me. But they they are draftable. Um, and Marsh, I have is draftable. Everyone else, like. I'm kind of out on Jesus Sanchez as a name like I've thought about as like a late Miami um, tack on, you know, with some prospect pedigree, but nah, I want to be done at outfield um, much sooner than this. Um, so I do have a couple more Ramon Laureano uh, just oh, laser Ramon. <laughs> uh, yeah. May- maybe I'm still uh not factoring in just how much injured and how bad he's been recently, but I'm still holding a candle, like just as one of the lone sources of potential power on the Cleveland lineup that like, I think a good Cleveland s- season could include him. Um, and then uh, the other interesting uh, one. Oh, Joey Gallo. I'm not taking him, but I just got to mention Joey Gallo. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even know he was a national. Uh, he's going to be an awesome uh, player in Korea next year. <laughs> uh, one other player I will say, last last player, last player that I'll say, um, Luke Rayleigh. Luke Rayleigh was a decent rates hitter last year. And, uh, I mean, Seattle, every time I think of Seattle, I just think of right-handed hitters. Like, I think of no lefties. So Luke Rayleigh, low key, low key could have some uh, some some plate appearances, and uh, you know wasn't a terrible hitter like 
like by by rates uh, for for Tampa Bay. And and the last guy that I got to mention is Bunt Legend Sedan Rafaela, who might actually be coming back into our live sheep. Did you see the blurb on Rafaela? No, I did not. I missed this. You might break he camp. Like he's gonna like yeah, he's gonna break camp. Could Dude, win the job. Was, was, <laughs> if you can combine like his and Abreu's stats, like you might get you know. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, I'll just fire off couple more names alec thomas i'm still taking him for that like a uh, couple of weeks because he, he looks like corbin ju- carroll and it might <laughs> and you kind of get corbin carroll stats maybe accidentally <laughs> yeah yeah um uh i've taken some harrison bader uh as part of uh a pete alonzo stack um and i've taken some garrett mitchell just as uh, a, f- a flyer and and honestly <clears throat> he could be partial beneficiary if Sal Friedrich does go to the infield. Um, so that's that's it. Oh, sorry, I lied. Yeah, let's <laughs> I'm go. scrolling more. Let's go. We keep going. Uh, Adam Duvall, uh, I don't know where he lands or – He did he it last year. For, yeah, he, you know, he did it really. last year. I think I think he drove – like as little time as he played, the, when he did play, it was so good that like – I think he helped those teams, even though it wasn't a oh, fair season. Um, yeah. So we're getting even grosser here, uh, and like this is not something you should do. Is like you should not be looking at outfield and doing like contingent playing time picks. But Dylan Carlson is one injury outfield injury away on the Cardinals of being an everyday outfielder there, and. Uh, I don't know. I'm still not, I I can't give it give it up totally. That's uh, a post so. post post hype. <laughs> I will sometimes click his name. He's still only 25. <laughs> I will sometimes still click his name. They obviously saw something that they weren't going to trade him for the Soto, so <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, I think that's it. Um Yeah. No Garabi Grossman this year for me. Oh my God. Thank God. My Dinger Finals her driver, Grabby <laughs> Grossman, for the one week he played well and batted high in the order and took me to the finals. That's amazing. All right. Well, guys, if you made it this far, we appreciate you and you probably need to find something better to do. <laughs> <your life. laughs> but. Nez, uh, thank you as always. And easy, thanks for jumping in on this again. Uh, great having you. Um, yeah, any final thoughts on the position as we close out here? No, it's a tough one. Um, it's hard to feel good about the the players, but I think we we covered some some really fun uh, values that are that are in this player pool. And uh, yeah, it's got me itching to to draft. Yeah, six outfield. Um, take them early and then be done. That's all I got. Yep. All right. So for Easy and Nez, uh, look for next, I guess, before we wrap up next week, we should have part two of the pitching of all the late round pitching targets from uh, Tuma and Chris again. Uh, but for now, uh, for Easy and Nez and myself, uh, have a good draft 